Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Since 1949, Ruger has embodied the spirit of hunting in America. Ruger firearms are built to deliver the reliable and accurate performance that seasoned veterans demand and new hunters can trust. At Ruger, we believe that hunting is about more than just the thrill of the chase. It's about the freedom and opportunity that come with it. This is our heritage, and this is Ruger. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast. We're going to be coming at you guys all week live from the SCI convention in Nashville, Tennessee. This is our first time in Nashville, but this is our 51st convention. So it's very special and everybody is so thrilled to be in Music City. And joining me today is Dan Brooks. And Dan is a man, you wear many hats for SCI. You head up the education, humanitarian, record book. You spearhead a lot of the women's events here as well. Like you do it all. Yeah, well, I have help, so well, I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> but I'm not a one man. He's a band. humble man. Yeah, but, that's um, right. Yeah, you but, you do yeah, so much. Yeah. It's incredible for for yeah, SCI yeah. And, yeah. and its mission. And you should be really proud of that. Yeah, I'm proud, uh, and, and we do a lot of good stuff. So on the education side, it's actually under the Safari Club International Foundation. SCIF. For okay. short, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was like, did Acronym. I say it wrong? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, anyways, and the leaders in education are the Sables. Uh, so the Sables started a long time ago in the 80s. They were actually called the Lionesses. Uh, they changed their name to the Sables. And the Sables, for those of you watching and listening that don't know what the Sables are, that is the ladies group that is exists within SCI's umbrella. That's right. And their mission is conservation education. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of conservation education programs. We, we do them all over the nation. Mm-hmm. And we're actually now changing our uh, scope and we're trying to even do more. So we have uh, four new programs we're working on. And, and uh, it's just really an exciting time because it's all about talking about conservation mm-hmm education which is also intertwined with the importance of hunting and sustainable wildlife management. Mm -hmm. So what are these four new programs that Sables and and you and SEI are working on? Yeah yeah Uh, yeah so the programs are one one is going to be this custom education program so we'll go anywhere and we'll explore topics that are local to you. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. So one of the things that that we all know when it comes to wildlife management, each area is a little different, whether you live out in California or in the desert in the southwest or in Texas, the hill country, or even in the east, well, you all have different wildlife species. You also have different conservation needs. Yes. So, for example, uh, in the eastern part, like around Pennsylvania, you could have a, a high deer population. You could even have lots of road collisions. We would be talking about those types of things. You go down to Florida, there's lots of invasive species. Well, how does that impact conservation? Mm-hmm. Our program would would uh, address those types of things. And then Texas, you, you, you've got a whole variety of things that are happening there. And, and likewise, so our custom education programs, we actually, it's almost like an in-service. You tell us what will benefit you and we will create those. We have professional staff with, oh, I don't know, 75 years of education experience mm-hmm. in conservation, conservation management. And so we would actually say, hey, what do you need? We're going to come to you. We're going to make it tailor-made for you because we want people to get the most benefit out of where they live and what are the important conservation issues in, in, in their, their communities. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. And I think that's... Um that's something that a lot of people, when they hear SCI or Safari Club, they think that everything that we do um, 
is philanthropic effort internationally. And really 70% of our resources stay within our own communities. So if you yes. take local fundraisers and whatnot, 70% yeah. of that stays within the communities. Only 30% goes to the mothership. And so <laughs> it's really, I think, yeah. um, not spoken enough of how much SCI does truly for their, their own communities. And what you guys are doing with this yeah. program really is just that kind of next step. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the other uh, programs that we've launched into is is having legislative retreats. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really important, too, because as we know, whether it's at your state capital or your nation's capital, those are the people that are making decisions. And so we just recently had one in August. We had a legislative retreat. And we're there uh, just to provide facts. Uh, tell those people that are in the legislature or their staff, you know, the nuts and bolts about conservation, which here we have the North American model of wildlife conservation. And what that is, is that's a system where everybody has a say, mm -hmm. but it's a very successful system because it's a user pay system. And what that really means is hunters and anglers pay for that that's exactly conservation. Right. Uh, Firearms but, manufacturers. Th that's exactly right. But everybody benefits. But what the cornerstone is, is we're making decisions on science. It's sustainable wildlife management. And so that's an, a, another program that So what I think a lot of people, forward. you know, is is the court of public opinion. Laird Hamberlin said this the other night. It was really brilliant. The court <laughs> of public opinion is out there. And, and the majority of people in the United States are non-hunters. So they don't fall necessarily in the extreme of anti-hunting and or super pro-hunting. They're just non-hunters. And so we have to win not only this court of public opinion, but also our our main court systems because if we don't have people that are that are implementing and passing laws lawmakers that understand the North American model sustainable wildlife management conservation through hunting um, then we when we lose in the courts everybody loses regardless of the court of public opinion so right. that's where SEI really has that shi they're the shining star in the world of conservation and besides NRA you are yeah. the only ones that are showing up in court so yes. um, what you're doing with this effort is um, benefits everybody, whether they're members or not, which is why it's important that right, everybody right, is right. an SCI member. Yes, that's right. Um, our next one, uh, it's, it's a really cool one. It's just now getting started, and this is a college program. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're actually have a meeting scheduled here at the convention with a couple of college professors um, from a couple of really major universities. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to get a college program going, but it's a little different. Now, there's uh, already uh, NGOs, conservation organizations that are doing a college program, but ours is a little different because if you look at our the whole nature of SCI, it's about the wildlife industry. And so what this is, is it, this is this big uh, worldwide industry that benefits wildlife. It could be artists. It could be uh, game ranching. It could be other professional services that are out there, PHs. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's, there's now a new degree out there. It's called Wildlife Enterprise. See, they didn't have that. I don't want to date myself, but they didn't have that back when I was in college. But now there's this Wildlife Enterprise um, degree, and these kids want to work in this field. They want to work in the very field that's represented mm -hmm. here today with SCI and the convention. And so we're talking to, to some of the lead professors. We'd like to get a, uh, a program going where they come here. Yes. So this is one of their destinations, because think about this. If you're in the wildlife enterprise field and you're in college, what's, what's on your mind? Getting a job, mm -hmm. getting a job. Well, where is your job fair? SCI is your 100%. job there. So that's an, that's another program we're doing, which is really cool. We're really excited about. That's just in the beginning stages, though, mm -hmm. so I, I can't reveal too much, but I would say call me back in a year, and it's going to be we'll exciting. Have it, we'll have yes. it uh, in full, full force. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, these yeah. are these are all very yeah. exciting things yeah, that you're yeah. working on. Yes. And, and you also helped organize a lot of the women's events that are going on here this week, correct? Uh, correct. So the Sables um, have a super duper luncheon. So it's the Sables we'll luncheon. We'll be there, you yeah, guys. Yeah. So, you know. On Friday, it's a wonderful event because every 
dime that's raised there goes back to conservation education, passing our message on to the next generation. So it's a great place where they always have a good meal. There's dancing. I know the ladies like to dance. They're supposed to be doing line dancing. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> right, right. Well, I heard there's a Western theme, so I'll yeah. have no problem right, fitting right. into that one. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, anyways, and, and then, of course, there's a, a an auction that benefits uh, mm-hmm. fundraising for conservation education. So the ladies have a really good time. We have a good time putting it on. And it's just one of those things that it's just good for everybody. Oh, yeah. And and I think it's so important that um, the, the ladies, we all feel like we have an opportunity to connect with each other because you can get a little lost in here. There's a lot of men in here. And what I love about the theme this year is it's the theme is women go hunting. Um, and SEI is an organization that supports all legal forms of hunting for everyone. Yeah. And and we've never had a, a gender um, limitation on anything. We've welcomed everybody into our community. And this year we're celebrating that. And I'm really proud for, you know, 51 years SEI has been on the front lines of trying to get women involved in hunting um, and really providing that space where we can learn and grow and create and foster a relationship that would encourage the next generation into our community as well. Yeah, well, and you know, that's an interesting point that you brought up uh, because a lot of people don't realize this, but women have been hunters forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let me explain. Um, If you look back at some of the archaeological record, it actually shows that women provided 75% of the food. Yes, and, and people don't really think about that because if you Man, men, we oh, go man. out. Me, yeah, man, yeah. Me I'm, I, right, right, yeah. right. And I'm going to go get a big mammoth. Me and the crew. Well, what if we don't? You know what that means? The women were left to provide the food, and the archaeological record shows it. 75% of small game and fish provided the food, and it was provided directly by women. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, it just goes to show you, like, hunting in general is a, is a decline. The numbers are on decline. Women are the exception to that because our numbers are increasing. Yes. And I really yeah. feel like once society has taken the it's all about killing out of this phenomenon and it made it all about um conserving and providing and honoring and then the mindset of the ladies in this generation have definitely been shifting and realizing hey this is not only you know a beautiful process of life but it's really great for my family and women women will do anything to protect their family Uh, and mary cabela was speaking last night and she was talking about how you know as a mother you'll do anything to protect what you love and we are all um kind of in a relationship with mother earth and how important it is that we all reach out and protect that and it was really beautifully spoken and i I really think that's why a lot of women now are are stepping up and getting more involved in hunting yes and that actually was really prevalent with covid19 as people started worrying about food security Mm -hmm. people started going well wait a minute i don't even know how to gather my own food hunting is actually not only a a a skill that many had eons ago, but it's an essential skill today. Um, And you can actually feed your family. I mean, my kids all grew up on game and fish, uh, and they loved it. It's it's just whole uh, healthy protein that uh, just you can feed your family with, and so it's a wonderful thing. And then back to women, of course, in hunting, Who's better cooks? Women are way better cooks well, than I Well, I don't know. I got to give my husband some credit here because he's a darn good oh, cook. Good. I mean, I'm not kicking him out of the kitchen, if you know what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah. he does a heck of a job. And thankfully, he has a wonderful yeah. mother that taught him how to cook, oh. just like my father taught me how to hunt. And so I think that goes... Check sure. it and go both yeah, ways. Yeah. I, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I do think that what is really important to us all is feeding the family. And yes. that really has scored really high on surveys with women. Mm-hmm. There's been a recent survey out from uh, resource management. And it did show that, that food is one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons they hunt. Yeah. And, and, of course, I think we all understand that as well. Well, and I think there's a lot of... Um, people that don't understand they they look at selective hunting and it's been coined this 
very negative phrase of quote unquote trophy hunting and they spin it to sound horrible. Um, and it's selective hunting and harvesting. So taking something that's at age appropriate, it's done its job in the, in the cycle of life, and then you harvest that animal. And then you think about places like South Africa or any other sort of impoverished country where quote unquote trophy hunting or selective hunting has this disparaging spin. And at 100% of those animals are used. There's nothing wasted. Like we were there and we brought foods to uh, meat, fresh meat to orphanages. The bones of these animals are ground up and they either make fertilizer out of those bones or they actually grind them into consumptive feed for cattle. Um, and I really feel like people assume that because you harvest an animal that they're not um, programmed to eat. It's not in our American grocery stores. So therefore, it's in, it's impossible that somebody else would consume those things. And that's not the way it is. I mean, my husband's European and they eat horses over there. Like horse meat is in right. every grocery sure. store. You can go to a meat market and buy horse steaks. In the U.S., we would never consider eating horses. It's a very viable food source. And we have a really significant wild horse population. Why aren't we consuming these things? That's a whole nother, right. that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But <laughs> my point is, is that the consumptive quality of what we do in this organization, it's not for waste. It is for bettering communities and families and providing. Um, when we went to South Africa, the kids in the orphanage hadn't had fresh meat in in a quantity in a very long time because COVID had shut down hunting tourism. And so without hunters helping provide that meat, they really had a significant loss in that resource. And it was very sad to see, but the joy right. that was on the face of these children, right. like no child should go without a meal. Right. No child right. should go without meat. And it makes me very proud to be a hunter, to provide an honor in that capacity. Well, that's actually a great point. Uh, and one of the things that I found, and people don't realize this, but hunters are some of the most generous people mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And specifically, places like Africa, they're not just feeding a family, they're feeding a village. Uh, amen to that. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and they're feeding yeah. their, the soil and their cattle, right. and it goes right. into this complete life cycle. Americans are extremely wasteful as a culture, and, and for right. some reason, like we tend to have this better than attitude. Sure. Well, I have my meat that comes out of a package in a grocery store, therefore I'm better than a hunter. No, we're not better than anybody. We, you know, we, our consumptive nature is, is I think there's a lot more that we're doing that is, has improved um, how we consume animals. Now we're, you know, taking uh, segments of, of domestically raised livestock and we're turning those into dog food and treats. And I think we're getting better at consuming sure. meat, um, but we're not above any other country, that's for sure. Right, right. Well, and I would add to that, um, not only are hunters generous, but we actually complement those trips now with not only just feeding a village, but we actually bring humanitarian aid. Absolutely. Now, now we have this program, and it's a wonderful program. It's called the Bell Family Blue Bag Program. And we have people from all over uh, the U.S. that go hunting abroad. Mm -hmm. They fill up the bags. They bring school supplies. They bring medicine. Uh, yes, medicine. That's exactly right. Toothpaste and, just, and toothbrushes. Yep, yep, yep. A lot of these kids have never had a toothbrush or toothpaste. So we did yep. a blue bag donation. We brought a hundred pounds of um, humanitarian aid to to kids in this these schools and orphanages, and stocking hats and gloves yep. and just the simplest yes. things that we take for granted yep. here i mean it, those kids absolutely cherish the fact that hunters are coming there and we're bringing this amy bell um foundation blue bags full of yes. supplies but then we're also bringing meat um, yep. and it's really a powerful and very impactful um relief that that hunters are providing Yep, I, that otherwise would not exist. I, I would agree. We, uh, By the way, we give out those bags free. Mm -hmm. Now, you got to put the stuff in the bag That's yourself, right. as you know, but, but uh, people can pick them up. All they got to do is contact us at uh, uh, Safari Club International Foundation. We'll send them a blue bag because we want them to deliver aid. We want them to help others. And some people um, purchase supplies while they're in 
the country, um, the, their destination country, and they'll go to a local store there. Other people fly with yes. supplies. Personally, we flew with supplies from the U.S. over, and it's little things that, like, these kids' water bottles were huge. They were so excited about getting sure. water bottles. They're kind of hard to fly with, but if you stuff them full of other things, so if you take a nice water bottle and you stuff them mm -hmm. full of a small toothbrush and toothpaste and you know, make other fun things in those water bottles and then you can distribute those. We, we like I said, we had a hundred pounds of supplies that we brought over on our last trip and it was truly an incredible gift yes that is and and we also do big things as well some of the bigger things we've done uh, through some of the grants are water wells in some of these mm -hmm. villages they don't have clean water uh, Safari Club has actually funded some of these projects either through their local chapter or through the national uh, headquarters and so we've even helped put in wells uh, that you know everybody's got to have water mm -hmm. right uh, so w there's just been some great things that we've been able to uh, contribute to to help everybody in these uh, places where the, you know, life is just isn't as easy as it is here. Mm -hmm. So we've, you know, I'm proud of the things that we do. On our I'm I'm proud. It makes me so proud to yeah. be not only a hunter but also an SCI member. Right. The reach is so broad, and and um, you know, even though 70% of our financial resources stay within local communities here in the U.S., that 30% is literally transforming lives and changing lives in other countries, and it's making such a huge difference. Um, the the hunting destination travel that that we do every time we go somewhere that is impoverished um, that we're providing is something that those f folks wouldn't have otherwise, sure. and and that's very very powerful. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, we do other things as well. Um, veterans, uh, we have a programs dedicated to helping veterans. Um, we um, th that's done at the chapter level. It's also done at the national level. Uh, but veterans are one of those things you can have uh, just make an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes and, and you've I've seen this uh, in my life where they come back they may be not quite sure where they fit in the world anymore. They've been in a theater mm -hmm. of combat. Um, they, there may even be some people, as I hate to say it, but don't agree with wherever they were sent, but they still did their duty for their mm -hmm. country and, and for those people over there, and then they come back. Well, we have some programs that are just wonderful that touch their lives. We take them out hunting. We take them out fishing. We show them that, yes, there is another side here, mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, it isn't just for them. It's for their families mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I, I remember uh, one hunt. It was a, uh, a veteran. He was a, a sergeant, uh, and he, of course, was in the uh, uh, Iraq uh, conflict, uh, tank driver. Yeah. Uh, he came back. He was depressed. He, was, he literally was thinking about uh, taking his own life. Um, we uh, got him into to one of the, our veterans programs, and, and then we had this great opportunity. I don't know if you've ever been to the NRA Whittington mm -hmm. uh, facility at Whittington Center up in uh, uh, northern New Mexico. But we had an opportunity to take him on a hunt, a and we did, and it was an elk hunt. And at the end of that, he said, wow, you guys have mm -hmm. changed my life. You've changed my perspective. Mm -hmm. He goes, I want to do this again. Uh, it was an amazing thing when you see that, you see that transformation. And that sometimes that's just within a couple of days, right? Yeah. It's amazing when you realize that there's a community. And, and I think anytime you are experiencing some sort of grief, grief requires community to get right. through it. Whether it's grief from combat or grief from the loss of a spouse or a family member, hunting is truly healing. Um, yep social grief there's so much that all of us feel at home um that we go through every day that's how hunting becomes so spiritually reconnecting and re-energizing for us is because we're all going through things in life whether we realize it or not and hunting is that opportunity to kind of reset get your mind right and get back to what's important Yes, and, and another good point of that is, is you get to share that experience with others. That's right. That's one of the, the things I've, that's, I've always enjoyed that. And, and 
we have this Pathfinder program. Yes, we did uh, the Pathfinder Award last night. Yes, yes, we yes. did. Right? Well, it, it allows us to provide hunting opportunities to, to those less fortunate, mm -hmm. the disabled. And we just recently uh, took a youth on a, a Pathfinder hunt. It was an elk hunt. Um, but he was a kid. He's, he's a teenager. He wound up having a, a lung disease. Oh. And it's... Uh, not curable mm. he went through a transplant we lined up a hunt for him and one of the things we wanted to make sure is that uh his dad could come with him mm -hmm. and share the joy and experience anyways they harvested a a bull elk and the kid was just off the charts mm -hmm. right and it just makes you feel warm inside mm -hmm. it is there's when you see the joy on others, that's yeah. when things truly hit home. And right. I think there's, what I just finished completing my hunter ed instructor's uh, training. And there's a progression of the hunter right. where you're a numbers hunter. So think of thinking of, yeah. you know, a young hunter yeah. that wants to go out and shoot a bunch of rabbits or a bunch of ducks or geese. Yeah. And, and so you're kind of into the numbers and then... And then things change into, you know, you want to be the tag notcher. So it's really important to notch that tag. And then you roll into the selective hunter where you're like, well, I'm going to be more selective on this hunt. And then you roll into that hunter that gives back. And so there's all of these phases of a journey as yes. a hunter. And then what really, what I love is that we, we seal it off with giving to someone else, giving an opportunity to someone else. And that Pathfinder Award, um, it's really a great place that spearheads that process of, hey, we're going to show you how you can use adaptive equipment to get out there in the field and hunt. And once you get through this process and you relearn this, to pass it on to someone else. Yeah, that's a good point. Passing it on, mm -hmm. sharing your experiences. That's just uh, a, such a wonderful thing, and you're right. That that happened here at the at the SCI convention with the Pathfinder Award. Dustin Berg, we're so proud of him yes. and everything that he has done. Mm -hmm. I did a hunt with Ashley Lundvall, oh. and she's a former Pathfinder Award winner. And what an incredible woman she is! And she, I'm telling you, that woman does it all. Um, and and she travels the country hunting. She travels the country as an NRA. Um, advocate for right. um, people that have different sorts of um, needs uh, to navigate through shooting sports and hunting and she really helps people learn and identify adaptive equipment that will keep them active and keep them in the field and keep them living the life that they want to live and so that's one thing I love about the Pathfinder Award is we you know we find those people that are really impacting communities and families and letting people know that they can be out there. You can do anything you want to do and put your mind to. Yes, that's right. Yes. We, yeah, we do just so many things. Uh, one of the other things that we, we have is we have the uh, International Wildlife Museum in Tucson. Yes. Uh, it's a facility where the public can come and you can learn. Oh, I don't know. We have over four. Excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. 450 species. Uh of taxidermied animals we do have some live animals school kids come and and they can learn all about uh, conservation education not just in arizona but mm -hmm. around the world and sci also has the sensory safaris which uh, individual <laughs> chapters can go and they can purchase a trailer and fill it with taxidermy animals that then can go around to different schools or events and allow kids and um adults as well the opportunity to see and touch and experience what these wild animals look like Excuse it's it's in and, and feel like and it's truly incredible i mean the sensory safari is um it's an incredible program in our hunter ed class we had a bunch of pelts that we had brought out and it really helps with kids that doing proper wildlife identification as well, um, which I think is a great resource for those those training programs that help prepare kids to be responsible hunters. Well, that's one of the uh, great things that uh, SCI does. We have these sensory safari trailers. The chapters put them together. And, and here's the thing about the sensory safari trailers. They can take them to any school. That's exactly right. And the kids can learn hands-on. Mm -hmm. And this is important because when the kids are at a zoo, you can't touch anything. No. You can't learn about anything. But mm -hmm. 
in the Sensory Safari trailer, that's really the, the title of it. We want you to feel it, touch it, mm -hmm. learn about it. And then you can learn about the conservation of that animal around the world uh, and what its uh, life, uh, life habits are, its history, what it needs to survive. And so these are wonderful things that each of the chapters go. Mm -hmm. And we've had hundreds and hundreds of kids come through these sensory safaris, yes. and they're just awed about what they mm -hmm. see, right? It's pretty cool. Another great thing that SEA does that I went to when, oh, I won't even say how long ago. <laughs> In Jackson Hole, <laughs> Wyoming, I went to the American Wilderness Leadership School, oh, right. or the Alls School. And I'm sure you have a whole lot to do with the Alls School, but that's where different teachers or educators can actually go and get additional training and resources that will help them bring the conservation through hunting message back to their own communities. Yes, and that's actually what we started talking about in the beginning about the new programs mm -hmm. so that's actually the evolution of the alls american wilderness leadership school so we went from this place where it was only in one location mm -hmm. and we wanted to have educators come in and they got wonderful uh, lessons project wild nasp so they got certified to mm -hmm. actually become a nasp instructor which is a natural uh, natural Archery in, in the school's, in the school's pro program, program acronyms. You you got me on that earlier. Um, uh, same with Project Wild, and then they have a variety of other things. They they learn how to shoot if they don't have any firearms mm -hmm. experience. But now we're taking that show on the road. Nice. That's what the new programs are about. We can do that, or we can do other things. Mm -hmm. So either way, that's just can come to your community. So. There's educators out there, and they want to learn about conservation education. We're the ones to come see. I love yeah. that, Dan. You're doing yeah. so much, and that we haven't even started on record book yet. I mean, oh my, oh boy, <laughs> uh, yeah. Our record book is a tremendous uh, asset to the hunting community. Yes, so it's the largest record book in the world. Has over two hundred and eight thousand entries. Um, just every imaginable species mm -hmm. that's been hunted. And of course, it started a long time ago, so back in the 80s, uh, and it's evolved today, but it is a wonderful resource for anybody that wants to know, uh, where can I go hunt this animal? But it actually has other value as well because it documents your hunting history, which is something I'm very proud of. Yes. Um, and I can, it helps memorialize that you can see where you're hunted before, when you went, what was the animal score, mm -hmm. and of course then you can also get awards and trophies and even plaques and medallions, which I really love, the medallions and the plaques. You can even have that uh, on a plaque, your photo, which just memorializes that hunt. That memory. Yep, that's mm -hmm. exactly right. And mm -hmm. so we, uh, we have all of those uh, in the record book and those that participate yeah, they, they just have that history of themselves, uh, their family members. There's people that want us to print that out mm -hmm. um, because it, it reminds them where they went. Um, but once again, it's also a resource for our members that may mm -hmm. want to uh, know, well, where do I go hunt, Neil mm -hmm. Guy? Well, you can go look mm -hmm. it up in the record book. Yes. A and we actually take some of the bad news, too. We have hunting reports, so there's good hunting reports and there's mm -hmm. bad hunting reports. But that's what we want our members to have access to. Yes. So you can know, well, I'm thinking about going here. Do I, what's, what's the hunting report mm -hmm. say, right? Well, a Swahili, uh, the safari is the Swahili word for journey. And this really does help document your journey. Yeah of yep. your safari so they yep, kind of yep. you know it's a devil goes it's a beautiful it's a beautiful yeah. way to commemorate that and then relive that memory for your not only your lifetime but your your history of your well, family and that's right but also to tie that back to some of the other stuff we talked about you can take a blue bag with you when you go that's right you can help positively impact the community mm -hmm. so you're making memories you're helping the locals and you're actually paying for conservation 100 percent yeah we are funding all the, you know, majority of the anti-poaching efforts that are done internationally as well, which, um, you know, those those reduced budgets because of COVID when, when hunting was reduced internationally, you know, the, the PHs or I should say outfitters and um, 
professional hunters did the best that they could to continue those anti-poaching efforts, but they are really truly fueled through hunting dollars. And so right. it also, you know, when when you take into effect how we're protecting those imperiled species, um, not just through conservation efforts, but by literally protecting their lives, it's, it's truly incredible. Yes. Uh, there is one other uh, hunting award I would like to just mention while we're talking about that. We have this new award. It's called the Methuselah Award. Okay. And what it is, is it's not about being the biggest. Uh, it's not about this trophy hunting. It's more about honoring the, the, the old bulls, the old uh, bucks. Uh, they may be broken. Uh, they've lived their life. They've mm -hmm. passed on their genes. They've helped their herd um, through their life span and so we actually give an award now that's called the Methuselah nice. Award and so that's actually a great award it shows the uh, the homage that we pay mm. to all the wildlife and it's a great way to to remember that and be recognized as well and so you can get one of those awards in the record book but more importantly I think it's just a good way for us to show our commitment back to wildlife mm -hmm. wherever we go wherever mm -hmm. we hunt Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think that it's, it just goes without saying how hunting is truly conservation and hunters are the original crusaders of conservation. And, you know, today that legacy is evident throughout North America with our successful model of the North American wild, model of wildlife conservation. It is the most successful model of, of conservation. But what I love, in addition to hunters doing that, uh, through the taxation of firearms, ammunition, fishing supplies through the Dean Gill Johnson Act. Uh, when you buy a, a hunting or fishing license in your state, that is funding 75% of the state's conservation budgets. So we, we do it, we, we, we'd kind of double down, but then we have this great free market system that's conserving. And SCI is part of that free market system where we are going out, we are, uh, donating our time, donating our financial resources, donating our capacities to serve and give back. And so hunters are truly doing a three-pronged approach to conservation. And um, it, where we have come in the last 100 years would not be possible without hunters. Right. That's exactly right. I mean, so where can people, if they want to donate to SCIF or if they want to find out more about programs, where, where should they be going? Oh, yeah. You can just come to our website. It's, it's, uh, it's great. You just type in Safari Club Foundation. If you just okay. type that in, it'll take you right to the foundation and some of the stuff we do. Perfect. There's also links back to uh, uh, Safari Club International where the record book is. Mm -hmm. Very easy to find. You type that in. You don't really need to know anything else. And of course, you'll always get, you know how it is. We all know the Internet. You get all kinds of choices, but you'll see the... The, the foundation there and then you can see some of the stuff we've done we do conservation all over the world we do this humanitarian service all over the world um, there's just so many things that we're involved in mm -hmm. right now with the uh, we've already touched base on a lot of that the veterans the yeah. youth pathfinder disabled uh, um, individuals you can find a lot of that information there. And if you know others that might be interested mm -hmm. in having a leg up, that's where you'd start as yeah. well because then it's going to have our contact information. They may see something that, that they want to try to uh, compete with, like that Pathfinder Award. And we do get individuals every year. It's very competitive. There is a lot of people out there that that are not only disabled, but they do give back to their community. And it's a prestigious enough award that they want to win it mm -hmm. because you you know it's a great honor but we also give you a hunt somewhere really cool mm -hmm. too and it's all expenses paid mm -hmm. that's fantastic so sci is also on facebook and instagram and sci foundation they have two separate pages so you guys can find both of those on facebook and instagram um, and we certainly appreciate your time today, Dan, and oh, yes. everything that you're doing. And I know it's it's first morning, so we were all lost. Nobody knows where we were supposed to be yeah. <laughs> today. So I appreciate your patience yeah, yeah. and finding us. And I appreciate you guys for tuning in and listening to all the great things that SEI is doing. And we'll continue to bring you a lot of more great content coming out of the SEI's 51st annual convention right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you, yes. Dan. Yes, you're welcome, and don't forget to pass it on. Pass it on. I love that. <laughs>
There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Wild Nugget Cut Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Titus, and we are at the 51st Annual Convention for Safari Club International in Nashville, Tennessee. And I am with the one and only Rachel Attila. Rachel, this is our second podcast. I know, in two years. We're doing great. I know. I feel like the only time I see you is like the 10 minutes that we sit down and podcast. There's the high fives as we like walk through the show. I'm like, oh hey, I see you. I follow you. I know what's going on. Yeah. I've seen your meal babies. They're really cute when I can come for a play day. I know, right? It's so weird because literally I think the only time that you and I have actually sat down face to face is at the last well the sheep show mm-hmm. in 2022 and then here in 2023 20, yeah 22 yeah. yeah I'm getting all my years mixed up that COVID year really like wait what screwed. year is it well yeah. yeah I know right but the cool part was that Christy actually befriended me I remember like with Jesse Coy and like all the girls like them. the original Wyoming crew we were talking about that's like yes. 10 years I remember the first time I went to the sheep show I was so intimidated because you girls were already friends <laughs> and I didn't know anyone and I obviously have very fake hair <laughs> and you guys are like is your hair real and at that time I was a little hair closet and I'm like they know that I don't have real hair <laughs> That's because Christine's <laughs> always beautiful. And it I'm doesn't like, matter they what know, she does. I know. I have real hair. How do I answer this? <laughs> now I just embrace it because mm. I feel like everybody has fake hair, except for Nick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I lived, if I lived closer, like one of the gals I I know quite well from Sika, Alec Templeton, she's super yeah. honest about it. Has the weave. If yeah. I lived closer to a center, I would love to have mermaid hair. Yeah. But the reality is, I'm. It's hard enough for me to go and like you know buy groceries. So. Yeah. Well, you have to get it done every six weeks. It's it's maintenance. It's kind of yeah. You know? So what? Whoa. What do you mean it's a job? What What does your grocery situation look like? We actually like we're homestead and straight out. My where I moved to in uh, Central BC, we are two hours to the local grocery store. So okay. I literally like load up the Yetis, and we've got a cellar. And uh, my boyfriend's mom, she put in a huge garden. Okay. So now we've got this root cellar. So well, you're not gardening right now. <laughs> no, I tell no. you what, I uh, come to Tennessee. Do not bring a wool coat. No. Hot. <laughs> It's 80 degrees today, but you're going to need it when you go home. See, I thought I was dressing really sparse and quite fashionable when I left at minus 25. And, you know, they had to rock the plane because the brakes had froze. And oh, uh, then we get here, and I literally walked off, and it was like walking into a hair dryer. And I was oh, like, "Oh, my hair has been horrible here." Speaking of hair again, because it's so humid. Oh, yeah. yeah it's like, no, yeah. I'm loving it. I yeah. was like, "This is moisture." I'm is okay. I'm really okay with the temperature change because we just got like 20 inches of snow in Wyoming, <laughs> and like literally overnight. And I'm glad I'm not home, but I feel bad for my baby mules. Oh. Like, yeah. And I also feel bad for all the deer and elk because mm-hmm. I just really worry about how this winter is going to impact their numbers because they're dealing with some tough conditions right now. Especially right now. I mean, they're, if you have the snow packed in the early part of the season, that's when they're usually, especially for the does, they're going into it at their yeah. fullest and their fattest. I mean, the hardest part for the males if they're coming out of rut. I mean, the fall is hard on them anyways, but right now, especially when they're starting to get into that last little Mm -hmm. bit and they've picked over the easy spots, like you say, it's... It gets tough. It gets tough. Life gets hard for them. Yes. Um, So why did you move two hours from a grocery store? Two hours from a grocery store, four hours from an airport for love, you know, for love. Yeah. My husband moved across the world for me, so I get it. I do. I get it. And you got a special one, you just, you know, you make your necessary adjustments. So you do whatever. So how do you prepare for that? Because like, are you like, okay, do you go to the grocery store once a month then? 
you know, as it works out right now with the ranch coming up with calving, I mean, we got to go and get drugs for the calves um, and the bands and the CCA tag. So we're kind of, someone's gone to town once every two weeks at least. Okay, so it's not like you have to buy for like a month. No, I mean, if you really wanted to embrace Hermitville, you could. Um, yeah. Which I kind of do. Do you have power? <laughs> so we just I got feel Star like, Link. I feel like there might be some situation with power here. We actually, we do have power. Um, okay. Where we are at, we actually have no cell phone service. Okay. So as you can understand, like yeah. in this industry, when you're trying it's to talk really to people, um, it's very interesting being like, well, can you hold the phone? Our at the time we had ExploreNet, we're going to drive up, you know, half an hour. If the roads are good, I don't get stuck in a snowbank and I'll call you. A lot of people are like, huh? Yeah, they don't get that. No. No. So now we have Starlink. Now we're moving forward. Does and it work good? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. It is worth the investment. We yeah, literally. Thank you, Elon. Yeah, thanks, Elon. Yeah. Props. Um, for all of us hillbillies that are trying to do business in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Endorsed. <laughs> I, um, I, yeah, I am lucky. The property we're trying to buy right now has high-speed internet on the property. Ooh. We have fiber optic that's butted into the property line, and I'm like, Thank you, sweet Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I love you. <laughs> but you don't realize, like, when you're trying to do things from home, as rural as we all like to get to, whether it's our hunting adventures, like yeah. what you keep up with, or going and guiding, um, it is a necessary evil to have yeah. good service nowadays, yeah. to be able to do any kind of business. So are you guys, you're, you, you have your uh, boyfriend, they, you guys raise cattle. Mm -hmm. And you're also doing, are you breeding horses? Because last time we talked, you were going to start like trying to maybe do a breeding program. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things you're doing. So I have a hard time keeping track of the exact specifics and timelines. Don't worry. I have a hard time myself. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's God's honest truth. You're because like, I don't know what I'm doing, but my pants went on this morning. So <laughs> yeah. we're winning. <laughs> pants, hats, mascara. We're out the yeah. door. Um, that is a part of the plan. Since we talked last year... I believe it was this time I yeah. was supposed to be running a bear area. Um, I was also starting a mule program. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately... I took over her mule she, program. You know what? I, <laughs> she's going to do an amazing job of it. Um, I inherited a bunch of cows with my boyfriend. So, yeah. you know, um, the whole goal with what I've been trying to do the last 10 years is I wanted to own an outfit, yeah. you know, but I also realized I didn't want to do it by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I've kind of just embraced it because there's so many different roles you have to play mm -hmm. and I've just had to learn to adapt. So this time last year, I had an opportunity where I was going to be working with mules and horses more. I was supposed to be doing a bear outfit. I literally went to Arizona and then um, the gentleman who owned the area just said, you know, we, we can't make it work this year. Yeah. It's like, okay. <laughs> Now what? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that business is also tied to the mule and the horse side of things. Um, so, so I literally had, had to like changes. Oh yeah, Big I literally had changes. to go like this. I loaded uh, two of my geldings and I went to Arizona. Went back to the drawing board. I know. I was watching like these. You were down there with another gal, and you guys yeah. were riding through Arizona, through the water and the desert. Oh. And I, I had major FOMO. Like I was like, man, I want to be down in Arizona riding horses with Rachel. And you're like doing these galloping videos, and oh I gosh. felt like a cowgirl just watching your social media. I'm like, yes. Oh no, it was an awesome time. I met um, some of the gals I'd actually met through Instagram. Uh, Claudia Schmidt and Lydia, or Claudia. Sorry. And Lydia. Mm -hmm. um, you can edit that out. And then a friend of mine, Lindsay, who used to work with Sitka, she mm -hmm. was down there team mm -hmm. roping. Mm -hmm. And so there was kind of a team roping. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up landing a spot with my horse trailer at a NFR qualifying team nice. roping house. So it was, like, it was very interesting to pick up a few tips and tricks. And mostly it was kind of just a reset. Like yeah. you can have so many setbacks in life. And over the last four or five years, I've been trying new things. And it seems like every time I try something new, it works on some aspect, but there's other aspects that either fall short or mm -hmm. it's not the right opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you get to a point where you just have to keep going. Yeah. People take advantage of you when you're down and you're lost. Um, and that was one thing that I maybe jumped at opportunities over the last couple of years that maybe I loved the idea of them, but I wasn't quite ready or yeah. it wasn't quite the right chapter. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you're... Um you qualified for for roping? No, 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 you, no, no, you touched no, no. on that for a second. What, no. what happened here? Because no, I can no, no, barely no. rope my mule's legs when I'm trying to teach them how to pick up their feet. I'm, you should see me. I'm like, then they get like a kink in the rope, and I'm like, oh, and I'm like trying to flip it around. And hey, that's great training. Well, you know what I do is I just put the rope down on the ground, and then I shove the baby mule into the rope, and then I snatch their legs. I'm like, gotcha, sucker! I roped your leg. Yeah. Because <laughs> yep. I can't. I can't rope. I, and my horse. Again, I bought the baby meals from she's like 
are you left-handed? I'm like, no, why? She's like, I knew it. She goes, you don't rope. <laughs> She's like, you would never hold your reins in that hand if you were a roper. And I'm like, no, I'm not a roper. I'm, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Fair enough. Hey, funny. you know what? The we observations all... of cowboys. Yes. Um, no, I didn't qualify. Okay. I, um, through friends, actually social media once again. Yeah. Um, I had sold a horse at one of the big sales in the States through a friend of a friend, had my horse transferred there, and then this group of people were like, hey, we're going south, do you want to come? And I was mm-hmm. like, Sign so I I learned how to rope uh, five or six years ago, and I just started asking people when I had been in the branding trap. I was like, teach me, teach me how to help my horse, how to position myself better. And then I literally bought myself my first rope like seven years ago, and I got a dummy, and I roped it every night. Okay, and then I roped I'm, the gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna yeah. get at our new place, I'm gonna get a dummy and a rope. And hold King ropes. King King yeah. King ropes is in my um is in my town Ugh. Sheridan, and so I need to go down there. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna channel my inner Rachel, and uh, I'm gonna add roping to my evening repertoire yeah. of archery shooting. Honestly, that's what I started doing when I worked at that big ranch up north. There weren't many places that let girls ride, and that was a huge opportunity for me. That's where I really grew as a horseman and with my roping. And one thing is, um, we had people from all walks of life, whether it was. Um, we had lopers from the reining and the cow horse and breakaway mm-hmm. and practice as if you were. So like when it gets down to technique, I am not professional by any means. There are a lot of people you can learn better from. But every night I would literally sit there with a the dummy and I would have my rope in hand. Because you think about it, you're steering your horse with this hand, right? Yeah. And that's where you're holding your coils. Yeah. So it's teaching. I don't know. It was really cool to learn some different tips and tricks while I was in mm-hmm. Arizona. And do you ride with split reins or a single rein? What do you do? Depends. Um, my really broke horses, I ride with a split rein. My colts, I'll ride with a split rein as well and a snaffle. Um, but I do have like a McCarty that I have with my Colts. And the problem is, is that I have medium sized hands, but when you have a McCarty in your hand and you got them sitting through your fingers and then you're holding a rope, mm-hmm. there's only so much there's hand and space. finger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it just kind of depends. I would my be mare. like, hello, horse. Can you please just autopilot and I'll manage the rope? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's not the way it works. Oh, sometimes mm-hmm. my mare, she thinks she knows exactly where she needs to be. And it's kind of neat because she was my, my gorilla mare, Ivy. She was kind of the first one that she was very patient with me that I trained. And now, I mean, Jordan will show off and throw the kids on the back of her and go Aww. rope in the branding trap. And she knows where she needs to be. And That's sweet. So it's pretty cool. But anyways, yeah. Talk about full circle. Yeah, you're like a full-fledged cowgirl. Yeah. I'm, I'm still working on that. Um, my uh, The mule breeders are like, you're an official mule skinner. And I'm like, well, I'd like to have thought myself of that before but apparently I still have a lot to learn but it's crazy because you know I I've raised mule babies with my dad and and the last mule that I bred Otis who's like I don't know how old he is now I think like 14 15 he's getting up there Mm -hmm. that was the last baby mule I've had and so I got these two baby mules and one was four months old and one was six months old Mm -hmm. but they hadn't really been handled Oh. They were little, like, wild, They're wild animals. Oh, yeah. They're, like, little naughty wild animals. And everybody's like, oh, your baby mules are so good. And it's like, yeah, well, you didn't see them before. <laughs> like, we, we work with them. So, they're, I mean, they're amazing. They're the sweetest little things. And they try mm-hmm. so hard. But, you know, there's a lot to it, right? They're, like, smart, feral little baby toddlers on sugar. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, my one is like a donkey. Like, oh. when she doesn't know what to do, she just stands there and looks at me and, like, <laughs> completely refuses to move. And she's just, like... Figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And I could probably take a shovel and just beat her with it and she wouldn't move. Oh, like, she's just so yeah. donkey. Mm-hmm. And so I have to celebrate these tiny successes. Like, if she moves one foot an inch, I'm like, yay, good baby mule. And now she, mm-hmm. a little repetition. Now we, we've, we've accomplished walking full circles and, and we're learning how to move. And so it's very small steps with her. She's very donkey speed of, of learning. <laughs> the other one is really horse-like and is very adaptive and responsive and they're just completely different little animals but um mm-hmm. so I'm learning my cowgirl stuff over again I feel like because um it is a perishable skill like your reaction time and time with timing is so important um so and everything you know. is so different oh yeah. you know between horses like that's one thing you know some of the best hands I've ever rode with or like I've got to go to a few different brandings and I love watching everyone's style and technique yeah. there's no right or wrong no. way as long as you're doing it safe yeah. and there like there are certain things obviously that you do do yeah but the best hands are always learning. Yeah. And they have so much respect for the horse and like the mules, like mm-hmm. you're saying, it's like, it's like going to school together because you might be trying to teach something, but you have to be so open and aware mm-hmm. because they're looking to you for guidance. Yeah. And I got a big, very big draft mare across right now. Her name is Briar. 
She's the biggest horse I have in my horse string. She's How many do you have? Uh, we went, including Jordan's string, I think we have 17 right now at the house. That's a lot, yeah. But we got a few wildies that we took. <laughs> Don't ever buy a horse deal where you have to back up trailer to trailer and they're supposed to be halter broke in the middle of a parking lot and like release them like raptors. I'm throwing him <laughs> under the bus. I'm throwing him under the bus a little bit here. But, um, How old were they? Uh, well, allegedly three, five, and uh, five. They're more like 10, 9, and 7. Oh, boy. And they are ex-buckers. Oh, boy. So last year, those were some of our projects that we started. And uh, they have rowel marks on their neck. So it's really hard to build. Like, you're, imagine taking that baby mule. But now you've got one that's 1,200 pounds. But it's got the attitude of a bucking horse because no, they've been bucked that's out. That's why I got baby no mules. Tux. Because I don't want to deal with them when they're 1,200 pounds. Because they're giant oh, I know. naughty things then. Yeah. So, anyways, we had a very interesting experiences last year. Getting some horses ready for the mountains. Mm -hmm. And, like you're saying, building that foundation and trust. Oh, yeah. And a lot of it with that one mule that you've got that's more donkey, she's waiting for you. It's like a test. Because they're always oh, testing you. They, they do. They're little testers. Oh, yeah. And that's the yeah. one thing with those ones is that they had been... They'd been used so differently that they would run away from you. They had a total fear of humans. To halter them, they they would, I literally kid you not, I had to start putting a half hitch over the one's nose because you'd put a halter on it and you'd go to pack it. Even though it had been sacked out, I could pick up mm -hmm. all its feet. And as soon as you would cinch up, it would just go to bucking, like mm -hmm. just instinctively. So Those are the ones I sell. Rachel is <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to tame this pony. And I'm like, uh, I like my life and I like my legs and arms and I don't want this in my life. And I sell them. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I don't even have those ones around. Well, we had one like that a little bit. We got rid of it. We don't, yeah. we just don't. You, you, you can be the horse whisperer. I like the ones that are slow. <laughs> oh, and don't move fast. I'll tell you what. Some of the slow ones are really nice too. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, long story short, it's it's fun. I don't know. I'm excited for you on this journey, especially with this Wyoming property. Oh. It's all about chapters and lives. Dude, and you, so you have to come out. So Rachel and I have been talking about doing like a women's pack clinic or a women's retreat, mm -hmm. and I, 2024. Like we, we need to it. plan it because I'm not set up this year because we're not closed yet. Mm -hmm. But 2024, I'll come down. We need to do it because I'm serious. It would be so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, and and you got the most beautiful backdrop to go oh, and do it. It's we should so probably pretty. actually start taking registration now. Yeah, actually, I think we don't have to worry about it. I think it'll sell out really fast. Yeah, because it'll be very limited. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I think we should. I think mm -hmm. we should do and have and and put that together because that's something we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And even you know, calling Jesse and mm -hmm. getting her over there. I think that's a really cool part about SCI is that you know when it comes back to it, we all met at the trade show floor. Yeah. We all get to live these really cool mm -hmm. lives. And it's kind of been a melting pot for like brain waves like this. It probably started over a drink, and here we are a couple years later. And well, no, we haven't next... drank together, Rachel. Well, I'm really offended by that. What are you doing tonight? <laughs> well, I guess we're going for a drink. <laughs> we're going to have our first drink together yeah. tonight in Nashville. <laughs> yeah. Ladies' luncheon doesn't really count, I no, guess. No, I don't. No. And, but you, we busy. don't ever sit together. I'm always like zipping around working. Yeah. You know, I'm like yeah. yeah. I'm always at the rowdy table. You so their table this year? Like I didn't even recognize these women. <laughs> They were like dressed up in like full Cruella Deville costumes. Like you guys laid it out. I like, gotta give it, it to Sue legit. Slaw. She yeah. she's got the uh, the VIP table at the function and poor John Bear. He's one of the greatest auctioneers that oh, we've yes. got right now oh, in yeah. the industry. And we heckle that poor guy and we jump in. If there is a theme, you can guarantee that we're going head to toe in. Oh it. yeah, and you guys are on point with your costumes okay. too. Yeah, it's always fun when people got to do a double take and you're wearing a wig. You know, you gotta get in that alter ego. So I'm going to. Do you know Morgan Mills? Yes. I'm going to her bachelorette party next week. Oh my goodness. And she doesn't know this yet, but this will be out by then, so it's fine. But we have like this full grandma theme. So I ordered like a moo moo and a wig and glasses and we're gonna go to Florida and we're gonna roll in one night somewhere and bar hop as old ladies. Oh my Apparently gosh, it's like a big awesome. trend right now. I don't that know. Is hilarious. Nick's behind camera like shaking his head like, oh my god. No, yeah, no. yeah. Usually they go the other direction. This no, is going, going full front. We're going full front. I'm. I might even not wear a bra. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm joking. That, that's not going to happen. I'm totally. That's, that, nobody wants that. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's oh. But the, that's the cool part about it is, I mean, you can just go incognito. Yeah. yeah. No, we have a good time at these events and these mm -hmm. these banquets and and you know we've great created. I mean, some of my best friendships mm -hmm. have, have been forged through these shows. And you know, just to go from me being like, I mean, not you guys weren't like mean girls at the shows, but you were like had your click. And I was like, oh, there's the pretty girl. <laughs> Like, ooh, and I come in, I'm literally by myself. I'm not married, no boyfriend. And I'm like, hi, I'm Christy. 
<laughs> but <laughs> yeah, here, here we, we are. are. We're yeah. welcoming. So you have to just be fearless. Yes. And, you know, if there's somewhere you want to be and there's a room you want to be a part of, walk into it because the people in there will welcome you with open yeah. arms. That's the biggest question I get, especially around trade show season is, how did you get your start? Yeah. A lot of people don't know. I literally called Schnee's. They were the best boot I had ever found. Mm-hmm. I paid for my first one. And after that fall backpacking for Harold, I said, look, I'd love to come work your booth. Yeah. You can't pay me but I'd love to come work in exchange. Yeah. So I literally sat there sizing people's boots and working mm-hmm. with with Jesse. Mm-hmm. And that's how, I, you know, I made that working relationship yeah. for years. You know, I had had, um, the people over at Sika, they used to come and travel with the try on booth, mm-hmm. you know, and I had offered to come work. They knew I was a guide. And so I started my relationship that way. But these things are built upon relationships. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a cool part. Like mm-hmm. now we're in Nashville. Yeah. And, and we're celebrating Women Go Hunting. Yes. This week. At, um, and this is the 51st annual SEI convention. And they wanted to really shine a light on the fact that they are an organization that supports all hunting and all hunters. Correct. And they put a huge spotlight on women. And, and that's why I'm so glad to have you here because, you know, um, we just had Cheyenne Pistol here and she... Um, was paralyzed in an automobile accident when she was uh, 20 years old and she's 26 now and a successful elk hunter Mm -hmm. and it you know for regardless of who you are in the hunting world or a hunting journey like being able to look up to somebody you like you is incredible because you're a guide you're an outfitter you run a pack string of horses you know what it's like to put in the good days the bad days the long days the short days like you know what it takes you've got grit and it's 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 very empowering and you are also beautiful oh, no, right stop. so I pay when, her to say that yeah, well she doesn't have to but oh. um no uh but you're also beautiful and and inside and out and so it's something that every woman can aspire to be like you and I that's the impactfulness I think of this women go hunting initiative that SEI is doing I appreciate that Christy it actually comes from a spot where I hope that women can see other women in this industry and know that if you want to wear a mascara, that's great. If you don't, model more power to you. And I think for us as ladies in the outdoors, it's embracing those different roles that we want to play. Mm -hmm. You, more than anyone, you know, when you're in front of the camera, there's a certain personage before it. But we're also ambassadors for every other little girl that looked up to you. I remember when I first figured out, I was like, oh, God, that's Christy Titus. It's like, oh, she does this. It literally is awe-inspiring because you own who you are. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to be comfortable. You know what? If I want to bring skincare products to the bush because I, you know, I want to feel like a girl. But I'm Cape and Day, you can bet. I put mascara on because it makes me feel like a woman. Mm -hmm. But it took me a long time to get there. So I hope that, you know, in celebrating women go hunting, that women actually celebrate that in a fact. Be a woman, however your representation is, and do what you want to do, how you want to do it. Yeah, and I still get made fun of um, online by men that will be like, I just can't take you seriously. You have too much makeup on. And it's like, okay, well, then don't watch. I'm not asking for your approval. Don't take me seriously. Mm-hmm. Do whatever. But at the end of the day, uh, did you watch the episode? Because I think I got it done. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I, you know, I don't think you need to be disparaging. And I get, I sometimes I, these guys, typically men, mm-hmm. and I get so mad and I'll be like, I hope that, that someone doesn't bully your daughter the way mm-hmm. that you're bullying me. Or mm-hmm. I hope someone doesn't talk to your wife the way that you're talking to me and, and, and berate them or belittle them. Mm-hmm. Because that's the problem that we have to cure in this, in, in any space, yeah. is that people are welcome. Yes, exactly. And it's extending that smile. That's one thing that I think, especially since COVID, I Mm -hmm. know like in Canada when you had to wear masks, I love sitting around here right now and being able to smile and make eye contact with people because at the end of the day, you know, we're supporting women, we're supporting the community. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to be happy about who you are and be able to move forward and and celebrate if you want to wear makeup. Yeah. And like, you're right. If you can't be happy in your own skin, yeah. Then you're really not a happy person down deep and you got a lot more work yeah. to do. My husband's learning that I have like a big reset button and being married has been an interesting journey um, just because you take two people that are in their 40s that have been completely alone and we're like wild animals our <laughs> entire life apart from when we lived in the nest with our parents. Um, we did our own thing. And now like we're trying to learn this dynamic of, you know, mm. he would live out of a suitcase 24-7. Mm-hmm. I can't. Like, I have to have that home base. I want to reconnect. I want to touch my animals. Mm -hmm. I want to have my farm. Like, the last year has been really hard for me, kind of, like, mentally more than anything because, you know, we're living in downtown. 
which is really unusual for me, but it was what we needed to do in this season, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm like, okay, I need to have a place where I can go and get my feet on the ground and touch the dirt and feel like I'm cultivating something, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't have to have that. But I think as a woman, it's so important that we figure out what we have to have for our reset. And a lot of women are busy with children. And that's what I love about hunting mm -hmm. is a lot of times I think it feels that spot of self-cultivation and where you have that reset and you get confidence and you get regrounded. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, it, it's just an awe-inspiring time where it's just really, for me, I, I can't hardly go without it. Like I can come to these shows and I'm super social, but if I'm not back at home hunting or back at home on my farm, then I don't have that reset and I struggle, right? Yes. And I think it's the, the mountain is so impactful for a lot of women that have so much going on in their daily lives to have that reset. Yeah, I think that's a really cool part. And even in some of the meetings leading up to kind of celebrating the women go hunting theme is that you have to celebrate who you are as a woman in your stage of life. Yeah. You know, I think about like when you just touched on it, like as a guide, you know, I was quite happy with being on the road nine months mm -hmm. a year. I still wanted to have something, but I literally lived out of a storage locker yeah. for nine years. Mm -hmm. And poor Jordan, when we unpacked, he's like, man, you have either stage two hoarders, yeah. but everything's so meticulously packed. He's like, I can't say that. But I think that's, it's learning how to celebrate those differences because right now I'm so excited for, you know, the next generation that's coming yeah. up. And all of a sudden I'm grouping myself into that where it's like, oh, you know, to be 21 again and going around and guiding all over the world. But I got to live that and I got to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, now it's important to me, you know, wherever Jordan and I go, if it's our goal to raise a family, I want to be able to do so on the ranch. Ooh. I want to, whoa, 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 okay, whoa. easy, easy. But there's like time out here, talked. Rachel, what's going on? No, 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 no. <laughs> but like, it's, a, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's becoming okay because so much of our identity as a woman, whether it's in our yeah. hair, it's in our appearance, it's in our careers, our social circle, and for a woman who has been in a guiding role and very transient being able to move around and do i've literally this past year has been a huge growth there's been a lot of tears you know not publicly so to say but it's like so learning how to celebrate where i have been mm -hmm. and learning how to trust the process but also realizing it's okay to be okay as your life changes yeah because, you know, you, you know it. You can get so caught up with the Joneses. Oh, I need to be doing this. I need to be posting more. Or I can't, I don't want to keep up with this. This isn't who I am. It's like, I've never been one to post 75 stories online. Mm -hmm. That's just not who I am. You know, this well, and she doesn't have Wi-Fi. Also, well, I don't have so Wi-Fi. There's, I mean, yeah, so there's that too. So even if she wanted to, she's like yeah. doing a selfie and she's like, I'm just going to hold this for myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know a what? selfie for herself. <laughs> the cows are really good at selfies. I just want you to know. But, you know, it comes down to, it's like, I think the really cool part about being a woman is learning how to celebrate those chapters and mm -hmm. as you grow and like, you know, I still want to be able to guide. Yeah. And I think having that network and building those networks, they help you navigate all the changes you're yeah. going to have in life. Mm -hmm. So it's cool to see. I remember Christy and I remember when, cause I had known her husband, I met him in New Zealand when I was guiding there. Yeah. And then when I saw the two of you together, it's like, Oh, this is good. Yeah, this no, he's good. good. He's I I uh, I think I married the perfect person for me, mm -hmm. um, apart from his allergies. Oh no! So he's very <laughs> allergenic. Okay, so Jordan is allergic <laughs> to hay when we have to unroll it. Oh, frick, tell but me he, about <laughs> it. So is Yogi. He can't touch the hay. You know, therefore, like if I get hay in my hair in the mornings, he'll be like, oh. You must have been with the hay last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. We have no. to joke about it. But yeah, yeah, no, he's... I joke about it all the time. But, no, my do my husband has dog allergies. My dog. My husband has dog allergies. <laughs> I almost said that. Uh, dog allergies and then hay allergies and, like, all these allergies. And, and, and I love all of the things that he's allergic to. So go mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but he's a good guy. He's a perfect person for me, yep. and and he's very patient. And I'm also yes. lucky that he's not like as uh, type A as I am. Mm. Well, oof, I don't. In know. Your, ooh, I think and you're a good balance. No, in his own way, he's worse than me. Actually, yeah. he drives me flipping nuts yeah. sometimes with his. Oh, did you write that down? Do you have a list? <laughs> Yes. You better. Did you do this? Did you do that? Sometimes I'm like, stop telling me what to do. <laughs> like, I think, like you said, it's it's learning yeah. how to be a partner yeah. when you've been so independent. Oh, yeah. And I yeah. I can definitely say I've definitely, I can chain up my own truck. If I get my horse trailer stuck, I can unload my horses. I can take care of myself. Yeah. And so it's been an interesting po process letting someone else have the opportunity to take care of you. Yeah. And... 
But at the same time, he also was like, by the way, I need a guide and I also need you to cook. So can you be base camp cook can and cook the whole the season and yeah. maybe guide for me yeah. with a smile on his face and dimples? And it's like, how do you say no? You can't. No. I got to admit but that um, was this great. last week, I, the last couple of weeks, I've been packing and Yogi has been mountain lion hunting. So I have to pack up the car at home. And I've been by myself doing it, and we've been together for three years, and I realized that I am spoiled because I was really annoyed <laughs> that I had to load my own car. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? This is BS <laughs> that my husband's not here loading up my car, and I'm dragging my suitcase outside. And when he's home, he does it all for me. And I and I realize that I've gotten very complacent, and, and perhaps maybe I don't appreciate sometimes enough, like, how nice that is that he's done that for me and, mm -hmm. and provided that service as a husband to where like, hey wife, I love you so I'm gonna do these things for you. And and, and I really noticed, um, I also have to make my own coffee now when he's not home, when he's hunting, so that's also annoying. But So it's these little things that you're mm -hmm. like, okay, I, I can still do these things. I did them for a lifetime, but boy, it was real. It mm -hmm. not was, it is very nice to have help. Mm -hmm. It is nice. It's it nice is nice to have help. <laughs> But it's also nice doing life with, with someone that... Is your best friend? Yeah, and and appreciates your story. Like, mm -hmm. so many, I, you know, when it comes to relationships, if I can give one gr advice to women that are in any industry, is there's going to be a certain allure to your job. But wait it out. Wait till you find someone that compliments your life, mm -hmm. that isn't just allured to it, but that can keep up yeah. or respect it. And I think that's one thing, yeah. you know, with how society's going and half the stuff you see on TV these days, it's like, man, I... I wish someone would have told that to me about 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, I think as much as we can do everything for ourselves as strong, independent women, there is nothing stronger than saying, you know what, I can do this, but I, I, I can, ex I can accept help. Yeah. I can accept having, you yeah. know, a man or, or a different role in my life. And I think to me, that was kind of like the juxtaposition in my career where yeah. it's like, oh. You know what? Mm -hmm. He's going to pull shoes for me to so and reshoe my horse so I can go hunting next week. Yeah. I'm okay having I'm help. Okay I have that. no shame in that game, you know. Yeah. Like I used to feel compelled, I have to gut out my own animal. I have to get out of my way. And now my husband's like grabs a knife and I'm like, "Okay, I'll hold the leg." I really don't care. I know how to do it, mm -hmm. but if he wants to do it mm -hmm. and we do it together mm -hmm. and I'm not the one like diving all in necessarily, I don't really care anymore. It's like, mm -hmm. "Okay, we can, to we prove. can do no exactly like yeah. I'm okay with this you can treat me like a lady open mm -hmm. the door for me I'm good with these things I'm mm -hmm. not gonna complain you think about it though how much society has gone like this like even when we started there wasn't hardly any women's hunting gear yeah there was really not a lot to speak yeah. of it you know and when we traveled abroad it was still pretty taboo that women were outfitters or guides yeah. or, or the hunters themselves you weren't just a tag along and now there was almost like that proving ground mm -hmm. and you had to prove that you can do it not to yourself and not necessar necessarily to an audience but i think that's part of being young is feeling yes. like you've got something to prove yes male or female yeah and packing the most amount of my pack man if i could have shook and rachel a couple of years ago before my knees started hurting with carrying too much weight instead of telling clients look like you got to pack your fair share mm -hmm. you know now now you get to that point where you're like you know what it's maybe it's the confidence it's the mm -hmm. years in the field where it's like you know wisdom wisdom that's what we're calling it mm -hmm. the wisdom. wisdom it's because we're getting older how old are you oh do we talk about that on here well we don't have to i'm that's much okay. older than you though so i was just curious I'm 35. okay yeah no you're young you're a kitten still so <laughs> kitten. you're good you're good you're good you're like wisdom i'm trying to think of like where this wisdom starts happening and i think it's between 25 and 35 you start yes. getting wisdom it's after 30, actually. I think it's after 30. After 30. You know, when you, sure. I, that's the coolest part, I think, about growing up that they don't tell you in school. You know, they try and pigeonhole you to this life and this schedule of events that you're supposed to do and achieve in order yeah. to be successful. And I think for those of us that on the outside it looks very glamorous, we've seen the ups and downs and mm -hmm. the, the hurdles that we've had to go through on the back end. But at the end of the day, that wisdom comes from trying. And what did, what did you say? You said something earlier, and I was like, holy smoke, she just lit a fire. You're like, um, what, what did you say? Oh, gosh, what, gosh, did, what say? did you say? It was really good. I'm like, we have to trademark what did we this. Say? What was it? You're a failure, Nick. You don't remember. <laughs> gosh. Uh, it was something to the extent like of. Like, if you get knocked down, you keep getting back up, or I don't know, something. I don't this remember. This is where, what you it know, was. you say um, really good, uncanny things, and then you just forget it. Um, yeah. I don't remember. I can't remember neither. That's It'll come to age. me in the middle of the night. <laughs> we're like, I said something earlier. That's it was awesome, coffee. and now I don't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. I did not have enough coffee today. No, I can tell me you neither. That. No, I think it, 
experience comes from trying, trying mm -hmm. comes from being able to accept failure, but not accepting it to stop what you actually want to keep doing. Yeah. Yeah, you just you know, have to keep persevering. I know, I've sure had my fair share of setbacks, but at the same time, if you can't learn from it and take something away from it, yeah. that you do differently yeah. and not repeat, yeah. you know, then you're still winning. Mm -hmm. And everything happens for the right time with the right reasons. I am a firm believer and a testament to that. Yeah, I believe that too. And I believe, like, for me, like, our, our journey and move to Wyoming, I, I feel was, you know, put on my heart by God. And there's only a couple times in my life where I feel like I've really heard God talk to me is when I met my husband and when I went to Wyoming. There's like two times where I was like sledgehammered mm -hmm. with, with where to go and what to do. And the rest of life, we just kind of flounder around and keep going. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, that, that, you know, where we think we need to be or what we want to be doing isn't as is obvious. That's correct. Um, and we have to just really dig deep, you know. Yeah. Yep. But you're doing such a good job with everything. What are you, what is your hunt schedule going to look like now this year? Um, I really don't know. We've never really been agents free this time of year. Yeah. So I think. So you're looking for a job. Is that what so you're, you're saying? So you're looking for a job. So she's looking for a job, you guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, honestly, I think between Jordan and I, we'll kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out exactly where we want to be mm -hmm. and work backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, we might go for a hunt together this year. It's going to be interesting to see who plays Wrangler and who's the guy. <laughs> I can tell you who plays Wrangler in my house. <laughs> well, I have to say. Nick and Christy. <laughs> I, was say, I was like, I have my suspicions, yeah. but I might keep this yeah. to myself. No, we, we're packing in this year and um, full blanket squirt on Otis is blanket squirts out the back of a saddle. And Yogi's sitting 100 yards away, literally. And he's just waiting for us. And me and Nick have to unpack all the deer meat off Otis undo everything put the blanket back on it Otis is great he just stands there but I'm like he's not even gonna come over here he's just like you guys got it over here but he did walk and we rode so I yeah. I, I mean walking an extra hundred yards would have sucked so I don't really blame him but um mm -hmm. like and then you know even just like the mule would turn their butt to him and he'd be like I'm out he turned, he turned his butt to me <laughs> it's so funny uh and I, so I got Nick Nick's my um hey ladies Nick is my uh my steadfast for for backcountry mule trips I'm mm -hmm. like I can't do it without Nick I've learned this I'm fine I need him <laughs> I've accepted this <laughs> I've accepted it it's fine thank yeah. you for letting me borrow your husband Katie I appreciate that <laughs> shout out A shout the out real to MVP. Katie <laughs> yeah because yeah, my husband's not helping me yeah um no, it, we. It does take help. I, you know what I actually might do is I might drag <laughs> him along to go backpacking. Jordan's always been a horse guide. He's never gone backpacking. So we jokingly this year he was going to go in and backpack with one of the hunters, and mm -hmm. he's like, "How do I do this? I don't. I don't know how to not wear jeans and teach me the ways." So it was kind of fun juxtaposition to be like, "Well, well he can hunt in jeans. It just sucks if he it gets just wet. Sucks. Yeah. I mean, um, Nick's I mean, hunted in jeans on our trip, so <laughs> you know." Um, I think that's kind of the cool part. We might go for a horseback hunt. We might go for a backpack hunt. We, I think the big thing right now is just kind of reconvening and going back to the drawing board. And the, the thing is, at, at any point in anyone's career, you have to either make the decision to fight or flight. Yeah. And I think right now, last year, we had the opportunity and Jordan led a great crew. We got to learn as a couple. It was our first year. Talk about a first year of dating. Literally reconvened at the shows. And we talked for two months. He invited me out. I got to be there for the tail end of calving. I was calving out for another operation eight hours away. Came over. He's like, how do you feel about cooking? And then how do you feel about going to the mountains? And by the way, let's go to the mountains and you're guiding and cooking. And we came out smiling on the other end. That's good. And then we worked cows and That's shipped good. and no one died. Yeah. And then at Christmas, I was like, hey, how do you feel about house renos? And yeah. then the show season. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are one year in now, huh? It'll be one year, yeah. May 5th, yeah. officially. That's awesome. So, no, it'll be good. But that's, when it's when it's good and it's right, it's easy. Yeah. No matter what gets thrown at you. Oh, yeah. And there is a lot that life will throw at you, trust me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, and I, I think everybody has their own journey and their own mm -hmm. things that they have to navigate with relationships and business and personally. And you're just, you, you're such an inspiration and you're doing so much. And I hope that you guys do get to go out and do some hunting for yourselves this year. Mm -hmm. Because I think that would be good for your soul. Mm -hmm. go, go do some spring bear hunting. I mean. Hey, I'll tell you what. Sister, that or, come on now. Have you heard what stone sheep are these days? 
Yeah. You should be stone sheep hunting, yeah. actually. I know. I booked a sheep hunt for 2025 and 2021, and thank God I did because mm-hmm. I locked in on those prices, mm-hmm. and uh, I'll get – I'm going to try to hunt for a fan and ram, and mm-hmm. it's gotten insane. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Inflation's crazy, but no, exactly. Yeah. You just got to go – gonna go have fun and at the end of the day we'll have a smile on our face and what will be will be we just got to work hard to get to her it's exactly right so if people want to follow you I know mm-hmm. we've done this in the past but where do they find you so right now um, my handle at Rachel Attila on Instagram is gonna be the focal point mm-hmm. um, I've got the website coming out um, with a little bit more video content um, that I'm very excited to roll out nice. next it should be end of this month. It'll be March for sure. So you're working on it. It's a passion project. Passion, okay. Yeah, passion project. So what is that website handle? Because by the time this comes out, it'll probably be live then. Um, it'll be affiliated with my name. Okay. Yeah. It'll be just for ease of finding it. And then um, with... But you don't have it yet. You don't know yet. You don't have your domain. I have it. Yeah, I do. But you're not announcing it. Not announcing it. Did your it. name change, Rachel? No. <laughs> <laughs> no name change, no glitter. Okay, I'm We're just good. checking. Okay, I'm just doing a little bit of side dig, okay? I mean, the people want to know, okay? Right. Hey, I, mean, I tell you what. You never know. You never know. It could but happen. It's going to be a bit of a passion piece kind of around the Yogi guide and outfitting. and I got married oh. after a year. I'm just saying. <laughs> listen to this I'm shutting show. up now. Okay. Just shutting up now. Jordan, don't listen. Um, <laughs> no, it's... Actually, it's Jordan, kind of, you should listen. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> It's going to be basically everything that I've ever worked on for my own, regardless of which area we're tied yeah. to and which area we're not. Nice. So it's going to be something that is near and dear to me, and I'm doing it for me, Good. for the audience that I like hearing from. Yeah. So I hope everyone enjoys it. So follow Rachel on her social, Rachel Attila, and when she launches this, she will post it in those yes. locations, so you'll be able to find it immediately. Yep. And... Um, yeah, that's awesome. So give her a follow. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come out and visit with me here at SEI. I know we're so busy this weekend. And I just love catching up with your story and what you have going on in life. And, um, you know, hearing your cowgirl, cowgirl stories are inspirational to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home and get a dummy and a rope. And uh, because of Rachel, she's an adult onset roper. I think I can do it too now. So I'm going exactly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna give this my hand. Watching the clock. Oh, yeah. Watching the clock. Oh, it's... We'll get her there. We'll get her there. Watching. It's like she's waving to the queen here. We're going to get her roping, the queen. Wait, wait. So what's the technique? Show me again here. You're you're checking the clock. Checking the clock. Yeah. It's when you throw it. We'll get her there. We'll get her there. Okay. Because you throw your rope, you want it laying flat. Princess wave (laughs) 2.0. She's going to have a doll, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Roping Techniques okay. 101 I'm coming like next year. I'm like watching my hand. Like, oh, I've never seen a hand before. Okay. Anyway, thank you guys for tuning in to this episode uh, or this segment of the Wild Night and Cut podcast from SCI in Nashville. We appreciate all of you and hope you had a good time. Hey, you guys, if you're like me, you are totally dependent on OnX Hunt for nearly everything from hunting, navigating backcountry roads, even real estate. But being an elite member with OnX has so many benefits that you guys are going to want to take advantage of if you're not already doing so. For example, you're going to have access to all 50 states plus Canada with tons of valuable resource, landowner information, and you're also going to get added benefits like draw odds with top ret that will help you with all of your application seasons and benefits through hunting full magazine and to boot you guys they've got tons of great specials through partners like silencer central where if you're an on x elite member you really benefit from those partnerships so if you guys aren't a member i encourage you go online to the on x hunt website use code wild 20 at checkout and you're going to save 20 percent you're going to love being an Onyx Hunt Elite member. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this segment of the Wild Nut Cut podcast. We're still coming at you live from the SCI 51st annual convention in Nashville, Tennessee. And right now I'm with the one and only Maddie Damaski. And Maddie, you like are an amazing female. Number one, you're the litigation associate for Safari Club International. So you're like on the front lines. This girl is in the trenches fighting for a hunting. 
and you're also this year's Wild Sheep Foundation Artemis Award winner for hunting. So yeah. you're like, <laughs> you are like the woman, you're a young woman that literally is doing it all. I mean, I guess you could put it that way. I don't know. It's still like the Artemis thing is still so surreal to me. Yeah. But like the litigation Did thing. Did you I've even see that coming? So, I mean, I figured one day, eventually, yeah. I would win it just because, like, I mean, I do a lot for conservation yeah. and for sheep and stuff. But, like, I thought I was going to be 35, you know. Wait, 40, how old are you? 27. Oh, jeez. I yeah, could be so Maddie's like, mom. <laughs> so, I'm, like, <laughs> okay. I'm the youngest recipient to ever get it. I Well, okay. So, that just goes to show how passionate and dedicated you have been in your young life to conservation. Yeah. You so know, walk everybody through that journey. Like how did you start hunting and yeah, so it's crazy. So I actually got introduced at like a super young age and I was like kind of touched on it in my Artemis speech, but like I went on my first time when I was 18 months mm -hmm. old, I was like in a baby Bajoran on my dad's back and like he vividly remembers it. Obviously I don't, but um, that kind of like kicked everything I don't even know off. what a baby Bajorn is. You know, like one of those like uh, backpacks that you like shove a baby ah, in. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. I'm like, I don't have kids. So yeah, like, no, uh, me neither. I'm like, I'm not sure exactly what a baby Bajorn is, but it sounds something, it sounds European. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's like the brand. I think they probably yeah, just yeah, tie yeah. kids okay, to them now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I was like super young when I went on my first hunt and then I like grew up in a goose blind. So, like mm. I always wanted to go with my dad. I like wanted to go get the geese even though they were like twice my size um and then you know i did my first big game hunt when i was 12. Yeah. i got a deer out in eastern colorado i grew up in colorado and then you know went on my first sheep hunt when i was 14. i drew a sheep tag and then first international hunt when i was 16 and then just kind of like blossomed from there mm -hmm. and you know took that like passion for hunting and like the outdoors and the mountains and stuff and like slowly built a career around it mm -hmm. and now i'm like I work for SCI on their litigation team. So had you went to law school somewhere in the middle of all of this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's crazy. So I did my undergrad at Montana State in Bozeman. Okay. And then I went to uni or law school in Kansas at the University of Kansas, KU. Um, yeah. So that was, and honestly, everybody's like, oh, how did that like impact like your hunting and stuff? I'm like, oh, I still got to like go hunting. Like you yeah. got to still squeeze it in there, yeah. you know, like yeah. our family ranch is only four hours from there. So I can mm -hmm. still go turkey hunting or deer hunting on the weekends. Yeah. I mean, you always find time. Like, well, you, whatever you, you're you, about, um, you make time. time for yeah. it, right? Like if time doesn't just erupt out of nowhere. You have to make it. So oh, you build yeah. it into your lifestyle. Well, and especially if you're passionate about it, mm -hmm. right? Like you're not going to just sit back and be like, oh, I'm not going to do this for however long. Like if it's something that you love and you're passionate about, like you find the time yeah. You make the time. Yeah. You're like, okay, I'm going to rearrange this or I'll take that meeting in the car so I can drive there or, you know, yeah. I'll stack my time off, you know, on these days so I can go on a sheep hunt or a deer mm -hmm. hunt and mm -hmm. just learning all that stuff is, you know, I've always just made time. <laughs> yeah. So you're an accomplished sheep hunter. You're obviously turkey, deer, tons of big game western big game you've been to yep. africa yep. you've kind of been all over the world hunting it's totally ingrained in who you are and, and you took this passion for hunting and you're like you know what i want to make sure that this is available and an opportunity for everybody so i'm gonna go to work for sci is that i mean is that yeah. similar to kind of the way yeah, it went 100 percent. it's actually funny so i was like okay i'm gonna become an attorney because like i really enjoyed the concept of like going to law school she and, wants like, to argue with people yeah well and, like <laughs> 100%. I'm just like, I'm not even You're like, I'm going to fight with you professionally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> and I win was, every time. I killed it on the debate team in high school. Like, I loved it. You're like, you want to go? Let's go. I got words. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, originally I wanted to do water law and I shadowed a water attorney and I was bored out of my mind because oh, yeah. it's the same thing every single day. And then I ended up working for Wild Sheep Foundation for a summer um, on their Central Asia or Gali initiative. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like I could mm -hmm. use my legal background on this. And then from there, I just kept building it. Then I worked for Dallas Safari Club mm -hmm. for a year. And then um, when this position came open with SCI, I was mm -hmm. like, oh, wow. Like that's doing exactly what I want to do. And every day is different. Like, you know, there's some days where we're getting ready to go to court. And then the next day we're writing a comment letter about, you know, deer closure proposals in mm -hmm. Alaska. and. It was one of those things where I was like, okay, if I can take my brains and my passion for hunting and my background in hunting them. and combine them, like what better opportunity mm -hmm. is there, mm -hmm. you know? And 
I think it's so unique because, like, first of all, there's not very many wildlife hunting conservation attorneys. No. And then there's even fewer women wildlife conservation attorneys. And so that's been just such a, like, interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is my first show working for SCI. Mm -hmm. And so even doing that and being able to, you know, talk to different people about all the different things has been... So it's been really surreal, actually, because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I can combine what I'm doing for work and like what I what I love. But you love to do in yeah. your free time as well. Yeah. Which is I think there's so many people out there that have a job and they don't have necessarily they're not living their life with their purpose. And yeah. you really have identified that and tackled it and figured out what really makes you happy yes. and your why in life. And you've just completely ran with it. And especially for how young you are, that is really profound that you were able to identify that and then turn it into something that you're not only serving and fulfilling like or filling your own soul and your own cup, you're actually protecting other people yeah. and wildlife along the way, which is so important. Like they're like USEI is one of the only organizations that is in the courtroom fighting for the rights of hunters. And I think the only other organization out there that's super notable would be NRA. Yes. Um, and so NRA is also in these courtrooms and SEI and NRA work very close together yeah. um, in a lot of this litigation. And are you living in Washington, D.C. then? So I actually work remotely from Colorado. Okay. So it's funny when I was doing my job interviews, like my very first job interview, I was like, okay, on the posting it says like, you need to be willing to move to Washington, D.C., remote options possible and I was like first question I was like so what does that mean yeah. like what do I have to do to be remote and they were like they're like well is it a non-negotiable it's like oh yeah like I'm not moving away from the mountains no. to move to Washington DC like I need to be able to go see but sheep. you'll fly there oh, yeah. and go when you need to yeah so I was out there um this winter I'll go back out there in May um for we do our big board meeting our mm -hmm. fly-in we'll go spend some time on the hill mm -hmm. um for lobby day yeah yeah and I've done lobby day once it's, I mean, I've never done it, so I'm excited yes, to like, it's very have fun. that opportunity, mm -hmm. you know? And that's also the other thing is like, I travel a lot. Like I've been to, I went down to Panama for CITES in November. Mm -hmm. I went up to Anchorage for APHA's, um, sorry, Alaska Professional Hunters Association's big thing in December. I'll go back up to Alaska in March for the Alaska chapter, mm -hmm. you know? So lots of traveling. So it's nice to also like, have home close to family because that's mm -hmm. where all my family is so so talk about a little bit going into like your professional life because I feel like we're leaning that way just for a second yeah um what are like the most pressing like hot topic court court cases or or initiatives that you're trying to block or protect right now hunters from being enacted yeah I mean I think the one that's the most notable right now that a lot of people have heard about um we recently signed on to a petition for certiorari with the uh, um, supreme court mm -hmm. um there was a ruling out of the ninth circuit um basically saying that the federal government can you know regulate certain hunting practices in Alaska and that's so beyond the scope of what has ever mm -hmm. really happened because mm -hmm. wildlife is generally state managed. That's it's correct. It's not federally, federally managed. managed. And so, you know, to be able to potentially go to the U.S. Supreme Court is so <laughs> phenomenal. Excuse me. <laughs> Bless Sorry. You. Like no, double sneeze. Good. <laughs> <laughs> good weekend. Joe, please edit that sneeze out, okay? <laughs> and I did not make a mess. Okay. So there we go. Sorry. Um... So, you know, the idea of potentially going to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. is just so cool, you know, mm -hmm. and so beyond. Um, so that's a big one. You know, I think coming down the pipe, we're going to see a lot with wolves. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have Colorado dealing with it right now, Montana, Wyoming. You're even going to see states that you don't traditionally think of with wolves, like Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, um, the Great Lakes area, uh, you know, some parts of Alaska are trying to list mm -hmm. their wolves, which is crazy. They have some of the highest wolf populations in the world. So I think you Wyoming see... has three classifications for wolves, depending yep. on what area in the state you are. It's insane. And that's the crazy thing. And then same with Montana has all these different classifications. Now they've added buffer zones. And I don't know how hunters understand navigate some of these it. Reds. It's very, it's very difficult. Like, so difficult. And so, you know, I think wolves is going to be a huge topic. Same mm -hmm. with grizzly bears. Oh, grizzly bears is 
they we need to be managing those this has got to change oh my goodness well and you keep hearing about like all these more of the attacks yes well and you kind of hope that like so a big win that sci has had recently is the governor of new uh new jersey made it part of his platform to shut down the black bear hunt mm-hmm. and then they and had, we had to increase. reopen it yeah they reopened it because of a 267 or something percent increase in bear <laughs> incidents you're going to start seeing that with grizzly yeah. bears. But the difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear, a grizzly bear is going to eat you. Well, so can a black bear. <laughs> yeah, so can a black bear. Oh, they can both eat you. <laughs> but I feel like you're more likely to get eaten by yeah. a grizzly bear. Mm-hmm. Um, well, so, I mean, gliz- grizzly bears, you know, when they have a motive to defend or they have a motive that they feel like you're a threat and they need to, get, they need to execute you, they will do it. Oh, yes. Um, and so that's really, the, even if they don't want to eat you, um, so, you know, that's where the playing dead with a grizzly bear is so important. Yeah. Um, but it's, it is, the, the bears are, the grizzly bear situation is absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think, you know, the last real big thing that we've seen a lot of recently, and I think we'll continue to see is importing. Um, you know, we've mm-hmm. had some recent cases come down the pipe of leopard import permits. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to start seeing more issues with, you know, the African big five are kind of a huge one. A lot of people see like, oh, big snuggly leopard, like we shouldn't shoot those. And it's like, okay, let's look at the management behind yes. it and, you know, benefiting the community and all of that kind of stuff, not just the feelings and emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think you'll start seeing that also with the sheep. Um, you know, they're having some big issues with the Argolis from Tajikistan and hopefully we can get that resolved before having to go to litigation, but you know, that's always a possibility. Prior to my position with SCI, I was working with Wild Sheep Foundation mm-hmm. on some of those issues. And it's super fascinating, all the stuff that goes into that. And I'm hoping we don't have to get to litigation to fix it. But if that's what has to happen, like SCI is already like priming for yeah. that, just in case, because, you know, SCI, we're first for hunters. We want right. to be able to help. And, you know, the amount of people who come to us on a daily basis and they're like, hey, we need help with this. Like, yeah. what can you do to help us with yeah. this? Like. We want to see our membership dollars go to work. We're like, okay, let's help you. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's what I get so frustrated. There's a lot of people who are like, oh, I don't, I don't hunt in Africa. I don't need to be an SCI member. And it's like, whoa, time out. Number one, you need to understand the organization. Yes. They are the, besides, like I said, NRA, they are the only ones typically that are showing up in court and, yes. and fighting for these things. So when you think about, um, and Laird gave a really great example the other night, when you think about the court of public opinion, which obviously there's a huge group of non-hunters, there's yes. a group of anti-hunters, and then there's another small group of pro-hunters. The yep. non-hunters dominate the room. So oh, we're nice. losing the court of public opinion for non-hunters just based on the media spin that's out there, right? Yep. We're losing that battle. They're, they're, they're weaponizing the word trophy hunting instead of using things like selective hunting or managed selective harvest. So yes. we're, we're losing that already. But the problem is, is when we lose in the actual physical court, that's where we don't only just lose the perception, we lose the rights. Yep. And SCI is fighting to make sure that we maintain those rights, which is huge. And it's the other thing is when there's a local chapter banquet, 70% of that money stays within that local community. Yes. So a lot of people think SCI, go, you know, you go to a local, local banquet and all the money goes to corporate and the corporate goes to Africa and they don't care about what's going on in the United States. Totally not true. Totally not totally true. Totally not true. Only 30% of the funds from one single of the largest fundraiser of the year that the event or the chapter may do goes to corporate. So all of that other money becomes really disposable and usable for local outreach projects oh, and no yeah. other organization is is has as deep of a root locally as SCI no and you know because we have chapters worldwide you get to see that across yes. the board and you know so many states have multiple chapters yes. right so I mean I've been working really heavily with the two Alaska chapters you mm-hmm. have Alaska and then the Kenai chapter and you know they both have different goals even mm-hmm. of like even of themselves you know mm-hmm. and so looking at that and seeing how one chapter might spend their money you know I'm a member of a couple of different chapters and so it's always cool to see like okay this is what we're putting our money towards in this chapter here's what we're putting our money towards in this chapter like what means the most to that group Mm -hmm. of people like and it's always going back to that general community yeah you know and being able to partner with other organizations in that local area you know Mm -hmm. i'm on the board of directors for the rocky mountain bighorn society and we've recently paired up with the colorado sci chapter Mm -hmm hoping to work on our partnership with the Denver SCI chapter 
to just keep building that. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not a Colorado specific chapter, but I mean, RMBS isn't, but you know, still partnering with people mm -hmm. and recognizing that like, hey, everybody who's at SCI isn't a going to Africa at all yeah. the time, right? Yeah. Like, That's exactly right. And you know, it's funny, we had a conversation the other day, we we're like, it's weird because we've slowly tried to remarket that of calling it SCI rather than Safari Club mm -hmm. to hopefully take out that connotation that we're just supporting like African Africa. hunters. And it's interesting, in my 20s when I was younger than you, yeah. um, SCI went through this huge corporate rebrand and we still use the Lion and Shield logo yes. to some degree and it's usually for like specialty purposes. Yes. Um, but the, the logo switched from that kind of more elitist seeming symbol to SCI and then they did the tagline first for hunters underneath and that was yes. something that changed about 20 years ago. Yep. They rebranded and it was brilliant because you know, a lot of people did not realize what SCI was doing locally. They, when they saw that Lion and Shield logo, they saw Safari Club. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't um, see the whole story, which what it does locally. And Safari is a Swahili word for journey. Yeah. So it's the Journey Club, right? Yeah. This is all about your journey, whether it be in your back forty or in another continent. Yeah. And Safari Club is. Tr truly one of the like I said I keep saying this over and over, you are the person you're on the front lines you're yeah. in the trenches and you're defending the rights for people like me and everybody out here and to hunt what's so crazy is so many people don't realize that SCI is doing that yeah the amount of people who are like oh I didn't know SCI had a litigation team I'm like oh there's three of us actually yeah. we have three on staff attorneys who day in and day out we focus on litigation efforts for SCI but so many people don't realize that mm -hmm. and I'm like okay, you know, I've been talking with our communications and marketing. I have no experience in that. That is not my realm. I suck at social media, like not my thing. Um, but like, how do we advertise that even yeah. more? Because it's so fascinating because nobody does it, mm -hmm. right? And like, that was a huge factor for me in coming to work for SCI. I was like, nobody else is in the courts fighting for this. Yeah. Like nobody else is trying to protect these rights and this access for the next generation. Like. If I've had, if I've wanted to like spur anything on in like my careers, like I want to make sure every little girl can do what I did or every yeah. little boy or, you know, even adults, like mm -hmm. I want to make sure that it's protected for whatever reason that is, you know, even if it's just putting food on your table, mm -hmm. like I have a good friend, she's a single mama and she just started hunting to put food on the table for her and her baby. Mm -hmm. She's like, you know, it's expensive to go to the grocery store. Yeah, but I can go in my backyard and shoot a white-tailed doe and yeah. you know what I mean? It's, yeah, very so, profound. It's so cool to me. I'm like, I want to protect that for her. I want to protect it for people like you and I who mm -hmm. hunt the Western United States or the Eastern United mm -hmm. States. I'm, I'm learning about the Eastern United States. So fascinating. I'm like learning about all their different like hunting tactics and things that they find and they do. And I'm like, that's so bizarre to me growing yeah. up in the West. I'm like, okay. I hear you on that one. <laughs> or like and my South. husband's European, so they have some really <laughs> weird uh, hunting traditions. And I'm like, you do what? Yeah. And like, whoa, okay, well, it's cool. But it's also yeah. so cool because yeah. you get to learn about those things, right? Mm -hmm. Like of traveling the world, learning the different traditions have been one of my favorite mm -hmm. things. You know, the harvest is such a small part of the it hunt. It is such it's, a small part. And it's learning about the cultures and the society and trying the foods and seeing like, you know, where they live, where they sleep, where the sheep are, where the goats are, deer, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, that was a little tangent on what you asked me, but. No, it's fantastic. What you're doing is so instrumental, which obviously has attributed to you earning the prestigious Artemis Award because there's, I mean, I don't know any, I don't know a lot of, the one of the young hunter winners last year, um, uh, Hannah, uh, she is kind of following along in your footsteps to some degree and is yeah. doing great things. And she's working for Sportsman's for Fish and Wildlife and um, incredible young woman. Yeah. But so there are, and that breaths, that breathes so much hope into me yeah. to see women like you and young women like her that are taking and, you know, making these initiatives and moving forward to actually, you know, hey, let's let's make sure we have a bright future for everybody. And, and to have that passion at such a young age is truly remarkable. So you learned about hunting from your dad. You grew up in the, whatever it's called. Um, what did we call this thing that you grew up in the back of when you were a baby? Oh, the baby Bajoran. The Bajoran. <laughs> you grew up in a baby Bajoran. You're hunting. You've turned this into this dynamic career. Where do you go from here? Like, what do you, what do you, what do you, cause I feel like you're the, the type of woman that you're like, okay, I've got my eye on this target. And when I get there, I'm going to move the target back here. And like, I feel like you keep pushing it. So I want to know what your next, yeah. where your focus is next. Cause I, mean, I know you're going to get there. Yeah. I like, it's super interesting. Like I obviously have such a passion for sheep. Mm -hmm. And so like, I, 
would love to like fix the Tajikistan issues. Like mm -hmm. that's such like, I know it's more of a short term goal, but like, I would love to help with that and get mm -hmm. those going. I mean, I have two Argalis stuck in Tajikistan, mm -hmm. so that probably helps bolster that mm -hmm. for me. Um, but you know, I don't, I like, I want to figure out and I haven't figured it out yet, but like how to take what I do and like normalize it for other people to where they can like also get involved. I feel like people think it's so hard to get involved in mm -hmm. like these different issues. Um, and also just like continue, continue like speaking to like young women and mm -hmm. young men and you know, continuing to like, I would, I would love for like some sort of mentorship program. I mean, I know that sounds like so extreme, but like, I remember when I first started hunting, like I didn't have, like I had my dad, right. And my dad is like a good old Wisconsin boy. Like we had never been on a sheep hunt and you look at a gear list for a sheep hunt and it's like all overwhelming. Stuff. It's overwhelming. And I'm like, okay, so how does that like piece of gear translate to a woman's piece of gear? Mm -hmm. Or like, what about like face wash? Mm -hmm. Like, a hairbrush like mm -hmm. I have long hair you have long hair like I have to brush my hair every day I Otherwise, bring a little mini hairbrush oh, I do too yeah. I cut the handle off of a hairbrush it's the best yeah I've got little tiny mini one I bring my face wipes Heck, oh yeah I sheep hunt I wear makeup clearly we know you don't we established <laughs> this earlier today not clearly but for those of you watching um like I did another side little segment where we did a, a survey with Denise who was just on and you and me yep. and I'm the only one that apparently wears makeup while hunting so there you go so it's and you're you're <laughs> like I I have makeup on today because I need eyebrows I was dying because oh I gosh. have no eyebrows either <laughs> I know well, so like, <laughs> you, you can literally thing. you see my arm hair it's like yeah, non-existent not, like, yeah you're I'm like I look like, albino <laughs> I'm like uh, yeah I look like a little boy <laughs> I say that too all the time but I'm older now so it's more like a young man <laughs> <laughs> well and I always joke like so I always have my nails done on yeah. hunts right like that's my thing like I'll be in dude dude's clothes like no like no makeup yeah. on hair and like a big old natty braid and I'm like oh but see I'm still a girl like, I I've have got my nail nails polish done. on like yeah or I'll wear like a big chunky pair of turquoise earrings because mm -hmm. I'm like okay I gotta feel like a girl at yeah. some point yeah and I know? yeah I don't I don't ever hang that up but um yeah, yeah. that's okay though and you know so it's but it's, there is something for everyone. There's like, there's a way to modify. And what I love about it is like, I, you know, you talk to a lot of these women and they, what's in their gear backpack is totally different than what's in a guy's gear backpack. Oh my gosh. Or some so of the different. same things, but us girls tend to have like those things plus. Yeah. Like these other things that make us like extremely comfortable. And that's, I, and I, you know what, like guys can judge whatever I, they want, like for what, how I look, what I do, but I pack my own gear Yeah. and I get it done at the end of the day and mm, I don't think anything else matters. Yeah. I'm like, you don't have to carry myself. Exactly. Like exactly. If I want to, I actually had a guide. I was on a backpack trip this year and I'm just like sitting outside because it was a beautiful evening and I like grab my little hairbrush and I'm brushing out my hair and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, Oh, I'm brushing my hair. And he's like, I can't believe you packed a hairbrush. And I was like, what do you want? Dreadlocks at the end like, of 10 days? <laughs> I was like, okay, this whole, you know, five ounces. I understand we're on a backpack hunt, but like, I'm perfectly fine carrying this whole five ounces or whatever it is, probably not even five ounces on my own. It has no impact. Has it slowed me down? Have I done anything? Has it that, affected you in your life has it affected at all? you in any yeah. way? Like, have you ever been sitting up there on the top being like, come on, Maddie, like. You have that five ounce hairbrush and it's really weighing us yeah. down. <laughs> like, come on, talk to talk. I'm like, dude, it doesn't even get dark. Like, no, you're let's fine. Let's hang out. Yeah. So. Yeah. But it's always funny because, like, I feel like some guys are like, yeah, let's nitpick that. I'm like, why? Yeah. No, I get it all the time. I can't take you seriously because you have makeup on. And I'm like, so don't. Don't take me seriously. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> Go like, away. Okay, so do you want to talk some jokes? Go away. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, whatever. Yeah. I, I just, it's really hard. It's very frustrating. But I think a lot of women, um, like myself, that I'm like, okay, whatever. You can say whatever you want. If another girl wants to come and hunt and she wants to wear a flipping tutu I don't care yeah like I mean imagine like little girls like they want to hunt and you're gonna you know your little girl shows up to go hunting with you and she has her little camo pants on and a pink tutu I'm gonna take my little girl in a pink tutu hunting I'm not oh, gonna yeah. kick her out and be like oh you can't wear that pink tutu oh, you can't wear that I'm like why does it matter no doesn't like, matter let's get them out there and yeah. I think that's one really cool thing about like which that's what we should hunting. have a little girl go pink tutu hunting I'm gonna oh my gosh amazing. I'm gonna find one I'm just like you want <laughs> to do this like, let's do it I will take you <laughs> um I think that's one great thing as like the hunting space has evolved yeah. is I feel like people are getting more accepting mm -hmm. of a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'll be the first to admit when I first started hunting, I was like, no, you can't wear makeup. You can't have your nails done. You can't wear jewelry. You have to be like one of the men's men, like beat your chest. I'm here. Mm -hmm. and, but like, at that point you still felt like maybe you had something to prove. A hundred percent. And then I yeah. learned I don't have anything to prove. Yeah. Cause like 
I'm doing it. I'm doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. And so if I want to wear a big old, like, chunky turquoise ring, like, yeah. okay, who Jana cares? Jana Waller wears big old ju- rings yeah. and whatnot. I have one. Yeah. I literally, my sister bought it for me, and it's the same width as my finger, mm-hmm. so it fits in and out of my gloves. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And I had a guy be like, doesn't your hand get cold? I'm like, I mean, my hands are always cold. Yeah. Like, doesn't Mine matter. are cold right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which is surprising with how warm this space yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, But it's like, okay. Yeah. You know, and I think that's one thing is like women I think are learning less that they have to prove themselves mm-hmm. because they're just getting out there and they're doing it mm-hmm. and they're doing it for whatever reason they want to do mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And, and I love that. And it's so non-traditional. Right. And so I think so many people expect you to like want to still conform to whatever they have in their head. Yeah. And it's like, why? Yeah. And then you break the mold, right? Yeah. Like you've done all this incredible stuff with your journey. And like, for me, I'm like, okay, well it's being an attorney in this space mm-hmm. is traditionally for men. Mm hmm. So I'm going to be a woman and do it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, yeah. And it's not, this isn't something that is like forced for you. This is something that is a passion project for you and it is completely organic. And that's, that's what I respect and admire about you so much because it is like you, like you're talking about sheep hunting, our, our golly hunting. You're, you've been, do you have a slam yet? Yeah, I have three. You have three slams of sheep. (laughs) So I mean, you have hunted I knew you had at least one. I thought you had one for sure, but three is really yeah. impressive. But well, you, and that's the other I thing. Mean, a lot of like, people don't realize that. I don't really put it out there. No, and that's okay. But my point is is that anybody from anywhere can say anything they want about anyone, but when you harvest a sheep, you've accomplished something that is physically and mentally extremely difficult. Oh and my that gosh, just goes yeah. to show your determination and capability. Yeah. It's funny. So I was talking about the sheep hunt I went on this year, and... I went backpacking for 18 days. Mm-hmm. I was unsuccessful. And the amount of people who were like, oh, yeah, like, aren't you just so upset? And I was like, why? Like, I still spent 18 mountain or eighteen days mm-hmm. in the mountains, which, like, fuels my fire, yeah. like, gets me stoked on life. I was mm-hmm. like, why would I be sad about that? Mm-hmm. Like, this is incredible. Mm-hmm. Like, I want everybody to be able to do this, like, mm-hmm. even if you're not hunting. And, like, yeah. obviously, would I have loved to have gotten a ram? Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah. But is that what it's all about? Like, no. You know, and this trip was my first, like, 100% by myself. Like, I flew mm-hmm. up there by myself. I, like, chartered in by myself, was hunting by myself. Like, you know, I've hunted by myself, but my dad is always, like, yeah. you know, just over the mountain. Mm-hmm. And this was the first time, like, he was up in the Northwest Territories, and I was in BC. And, proving to myself like mm-hmm. hey you're fully capable of yeah. being 100% how do you own. how do you do that being a US resident so I was with an outfitter. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. okay, oh sorry. Okay. I should have clarified. Like, I was like with an outfitter. Like, how yeah. did you do that? Like, what am I missing here? You're like, um, in Maddie, BC, are you like, what is be going on? Sure. Okay, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Roger, okay, yeah. I'm tracking now. I'm like, wait a second. Time out here. Like, let's not incriminate yourself yeah, here. Yeah, you're like, um, okay, <laughs> Let me so delete you this as part. an attorney, I would suggest that you not talk about this. No, I'm not an attorney, obviously. <laughs> I'm not that smart. Um, no, that is, okay, I was like hold on here okay what did I miss no that's perfect no but I I understand what you're saying like because it is it is you know like we had that this year so I have mules I've grown up packing into the back country with my dad yep I don't even think about it me and my dad go we pack in it's no big deal well this year my dad didn't go with us so I have my husband and my cameraman and me and everybody throws their stuff into a pile and they're like okay put it on the mules and I'm like Dad's You're not like, here. My dad? <laughs> He's like, not at here to help me. <laughs> and it, like, it was literally like, okay, this is all on me. Like, yeah. it, you know, it was just very profound. Like, okay, uh, all the things that my dad taught me now. Now other people are responsible, yeah. you know, I'm responsible for other people in this, this experience. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then I was like a little panicked because we were going into a new area and da, 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 da. Yeah. no trails. And we didn't know if there was water and like, but I did it. And I was yeah. like, ah, my dad would be so proud. And I'm only 42. Yay. Yeah, but, <laughs> it, but you know what so I mean? It doesn't amazing. matter how old you are. Right. Yeah. It doesn't it's, matter. It's such an amazing feeling. Like, yeah. you know, when I got home and I was like talking to my dad, he was so proud of me because yes. I'm like telling him all these things and he's like. I was like, just kept saying thank you. I was like, yeah. thank you for teaching me and raising me and to mm-hmm. do all of this stuff, you know? Like, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been comfortable doing that. Yeah. I mean, mind you, I probably would have been like 17. So yeah, I yeah, yeah. That, You're but, pretty young. Um, yeah. And I would hope that at 17, you wouldn't, I mean, no. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's, I'm so thankful that he, like, mm-hmm. raised me that way. Yeah. Like, 
to be You're able a to strong go and, do and it. capable woman. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but like my dad was like one of the people like from a very young age. He's like, okay, you're just going to go do it. Yeah. I'd be like, Hey dad, can you show me how to do this? He's like, you can perfectly find, figure yeah. out how to do that. Exactly. You want to go meet that person. I remember my very first hunting show. I wanted to meet, um, Jim Shockey. And I was like, so he was excited. just here. You just missed was him. He? Yeah. Oh, that's just so funny. Him. I was like, I need to meet Jim Shockey. And I saw him at a friend of ours's booth and I'm just like staring and I'm like, dad, can you introduce me? Cause I knew they'd met before. And he's like, no, you can go introduce yourself. And I was like, um, no, I can't. I'm like 15, dude. Like no way. And he was like, yeah, you can like, and so he just always instilled mm-hmm. that like in us and like confidence in us. Like, okay, come on. Like you can do yeah, it. You can do this. And it's so amazing. And like, you know, being able to bring that into everything of like going to law school during a global pandemic mm-hmm. and starting a new job and going hunting and doing all the things. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can you can do, can this. do it all. Yeah, you can literally do it all. Yeah, that's really incredible. And I love that about your dad. My dad was very similar. Yeah. And he would let me like figure things out until I asked for help. <laughs> yeah. And then when I asked for help, then he'd be like, okay, I'll give you help. But he made me genuinely like make an attempt until yes. I was frustrated. But at some points, like I, I was the kind of person where I'm like, get away from me. I want your help. Don't touch me. Yeah. <laughs> I got this. And then, and then when I was exhausted and like on the verge of tears or something, then I'd be like, okay, I'll have help. Okay. I guess. <laughs> I, can't, like, I need help. help okay. Yeah. <laughs> please help me. Uh, but it took like serious desperation. <laughs> oh yeah. And I'm still that way. Like my husband gives me a heck of a time because I hate asking for help when it comes to my business <laughs> or my career. And he's like, you know, maybe you need to hire someone. I'm like, I don't need help. I can do everything. Yeah. <laughs> and he gets so frustrated. Oh, I'm uh, the same way. Yeah. There's but, definitely times where I'm like, I should just ask for help and people are like yeah you should and I'm like mm, no mm, I got this I'm I got good. this so you're 26 right 27 27 you're living yep. in Colorado yep. you're you're an attorney and you're hunting around the world you just like you're incredible now what play what part have you played in this whole women go hunting initiative with SCI um you know it's actually really cool so when I started on with SCI they had already like decided that Mm -hmm. this year was going to be this like women in hunting and Mm -hmm. um women go hunting and all of this kind of stuff and I was like that's so cool Mm -hmm. you know because like we were talking about this earlier like they've never done that before so like might as well celebrate it and so it's been fun I've been like I've helped the crew you know bounce some ideas off of Mm -hmm. each other and you know I was like okay like let's talk to this person let's Mm -hmm. do this you know and Let's just keep celebrating it. And I wish I would have had more of a hand in it, but it's just been like such a whirlwind since starting with SCI. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely well, been Well, Denise like, has really done a great cool. job. Oh my like, gosh. She it. is She's an so incredible woman. wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's been so cool. And like talking about the different events she set up and how she forced Laird to be like, hey, dude, let's do this. And it's mm-hmm. like, let's do this. Why have we done It takes a powerful this? woman sometimes to uh, enact change. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It really does, you know? And it's it's so cool. And like the fact that Laird was so responsive. He's to amazing. It. Oh, he's so amazing. I was, I'm not going to lie, I was intimidated the first time I met him. I mean, as, as anybody would be when you're meeting your like future boss his boss his boss you know um but he's been so wonderful mm-hmm. and like you know he's been very much like hey what more can we do for women like how can we keep promoting this like what do we got to do you know mm-hmm. and being able to be in an organization that's so much like okay what do we got to do to promote women this year and continue to promote women you mm-hmm. know we've every week we do in our weekly report there's a blurb about a different woman who's hunted and i love that it's so cool. and i love your guys's weekly reports by the way Aren't they that you and Ben put together? Yes. Those are, if you guys are not subscribing to those, oh, um, how, do they, how do people subscribe? You go to the um, website and... Yep. So on the website, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember exactly what link it's under. It's under the advocacy link and there will be a spot where you can sign up for our weekly emails. Yeah. And you guys should do it because yes. they give you all the updates on what's going on in domestic and international litigation. Yep. The key points that SCI is arguing, fighting... Yeah. whatever and they have this great new section where they talk about a highlighted woman yeah and it's it's honestly great because you get a view into like what we're doing on the litigation team mm-hmm. what we're doing like at the capitol in congress in senate in the senate what we're doing internationally you know CITES, um all of that kind of stuff and then we also share like our post of the week so if you don't have mm-hmm. instagram you can still see like Last week it was about um, Senator or Steve Daines, mm-hmm. and you know a couple weeks ago it was about the Canada rifle mm-hmm. um, bill being like taken mm-hmm. out, you mm-hmm. know. And so 
it's always a great way to stay up to date. And we also include articles from other websites. Yeah. So we might have something about the Federal Subsistence Board in Alaska. And for me, it's such a great just key pieces from the week, mm -hmm. you know, because I always find it really hard to stay up to date on everything. And I think in our society, we feel the need to stay like have the knowledge of everything that's going on at mm -hmm. all times and you always want to be the most knowledgeable and sometimes that's hard it is very difficult you know it is well and it's so hard because like there's so there's SEI is such a dynamic organization that it's easy to lose the pulse on one limb or another and this yeah. just kind of pulls some things together and yeah. makes it a kind of a uniform one-stop shop to like figure out what is really going on. Yeah, well, and especially like if you're in the Western United States, like I said, like I don't know much about the Eastern United States. And so I don't think a lot of people yeah. do. And so we take like what's happening in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and we put that in there. So it's like, oh, okay, you know, New York is trying to pass another stupid trophy ban law. Mm. And so it's, it's a great way for people to kind of keep on the pulse a little bit. And then, like I said, then we celebrate a woman in hunting every mm -hmm. week. And, you know, we got so many submissions that we're going to keep doing that. Originally, oh, we should. Originally, it was just to, up to convention. But, you know, now we're like, okay, maybe it's every other week, whatever it is. But we got so many wonderful submissions from women who were like, Here's my story. Mm -hmm. Like, and pictures of women who hunt for food or to take their kids out there or because their dad taught them or, hey, look at my first animal ever. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's so cool. Let's keep celebrating that, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, women are the fastest growing dynamic. In well, the, we're the dynamic. only growing dynamic yeah. in hunting because the men are on the decline. Like yeah. our, our numbers for men is diminishing. And it's interesting because I shoot in competitive rifle leagues as well. And oh, I didn't know that for some reason. So there so is cool. um, like more little girls yeah. that show up and shoot with their dads and little boys. Like you would think like a precision rifle match or a long range rifle match, you'd be loaded with like lots of like oh, young yeah, like, boys. Oh, like, I gotcha. oh yeah, I'm going to shoot with my dad. <laughs> no, it's girls. Yeah. And these little girls are absolutely crushing it. Like some of these girls are world class shooters. There's a 17 year old girl that is one of the top five shooters in the country against the boys, the men. Yeah everyone like she's crushing the pro division and yeah. she's like 17. well they say that women generally are better yeah. shooters because we're more patient we're more relaxed the you know we anxiety and all that kind of stuff affects us differently mm -hmm. you know and i don't know about you but like growing up my dad and i had like our checklist right of like okay make sure your gun's level make sure that you know you're on the right yardage make sure your like scope is on the right mm -hmm. power make sure to breathe like all this kind of stuff and i think young women take that and keep doing it i mean mm -hmm. i've been now hunting for 15 years with a rifle and i still go through that checklist yeah. every single time i'm behind mm -hmm. the gun and i think so many women do that mm -hmm. whereas you know some boys they're like okay i did it once mm -hmm. i'm good mm -hmm. and you're like well okay. and it, I, I feel like boys are so excited to shoot the gun oh yeah that I they mean, like, i don't blame them they, <laughs> everything goes out the window and they just want the boom boom and the you know what i mean like yeah. i feel like little boys are just get so excited where women are more calculated yeah and i think going into shooting i think that's such an excellent like segue into hunting or mm -hmm. just being outside like I'm, I'm a huge proponent of women just even outside. Yeah. Like, if you want to go outside and shoot big guns, you go outside and shoot big guns. Yeah, or little ones. We don't care. Or just shoot ones. them. Just shoot fun. them. Like, have fun. Be yeah. safe. Like, yeah. get out there. Yeah. Feel, like, whatever brings you that confidence and that power mm -hmm. as a young woman, older woman, whatever, just yeah. do it. Yeah. Did your dad take you shooting a lot then? Yeah, yeah, he did. So we, growing up, like, the range was just down the hill from our house. So we would just jump on the four-wheeler and just ride down and... We'd go shoot all the time, and I'd always take like my little 17 and shoot prairie dogs. I and, love it. Um, coyotes and stuff. Yeah. And so we always shot. And then, you know, once we started getting into like sheep hunting and more long distance stuff, it yeah. was okay, you gotta be prepared. You gotta know how to shoot this gun. Like, you can't just have a big fancy gun. And, no, like, you can't buy success. Yeah. yeah. And so it's been, yeah, he like raised us that way. And even mm -hmm. my sister, who she's not a big hunter, she hunts some, but, you know, he even raised her like, here's here's you got to do it all and she is one of the best shots yeah i've ever seen i was with her in a blind last year um and she shot a doe perfect shot like if you were to draw on a map like exactly where to shoot like that's exactly where she shot mm -hmm. and she was so excited she's like oh i just filled my freezer freezer for the year i'm like oh 
You're the sweetest thing in the world. That is wonderful. <laughs> and, and that's that's the that's the icing on the cake, right? Yeah. You get the experience, you get the bounty, and you get the memories. And yeah. that's just, it's perfect. I love it. So where can people, like, if they want to follow along with your journey, obviously they can subscribe to the SEI newsletter, but where else yeah. can people kind of connect with what you're doing? Yeah, so on the SCI front, we have um, our Facebook page, our Twitter page, and then our Instagram account. Um, those are all great ways to like follow along with what SCI is doing. Um, you know, we post about all of our different advocacy things as well as our litigation mm -hmm. stuff. And then me personally, I don't have Twitter or Facebook. I've never I had a Facebook. I deleted it a long time ago. But I have an Instagram. It's just mm -hmm. M Damoski. Um, and, you know, I do post about some of the random stuff that mm -hmm. we're doing just because it's like, this is my life. This is what's it's going great. on. You're sharing it. Um, but, yeah, as far as what SCI is doing, I would say we post the most probably on our uh, Instagram account. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris Lasavita, he's our Instagram guy. I love guy. him. Oh, amazing. He's great. And he does such a great job. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, that's like the best way to follow along with that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And obviously, like some of the other big conservation organizations also have mm -hmm. Instagram accounts. But I would... Maybe I'm biased. SCI, I think, by far does the mm -hmm. best job at getting in front of people and getting the information mm -hmm. in front of people. And not just like, look at this hunting photo. It's yeah. also like, hey, you know, the Federal Subsistence Board shot down three different proposals last week, which yeah. is a huge deal, you know. Mm -hmm. and I think that's, They're also informing people on what current yeah. events are happening. Yes. Exactly. And like, here, how do you get involved? <clears throat> right? Yeah. Like, I have friends who are like, hey, I signed on to this. Um, petition because I saw it on SCI's Instagram account. Mm -hmm. I'm like, good. We yeah. need that. We need more yeah. support. We need more people to put their selves out there. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's as simple as typing in your email address and mm -hmm. sending off a letter to. Well, and it's not like SCI spams you after you do that either. It's oh, not like no. you're like, oh, instantly signed up when we're selling your email list and people yeah. are going to be inundating you. It's not like that. Yeah. Oh, if you get another email, it's like, hey, here's something else you can yeah. do, um, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, the more yeah. involvement you can be the better. Well, and but sometimes, also at your capacity, right? Yeah. Like everybody has different. a different vision, mission on how they yeah. can serve. But I, I mean, I can't say, I mean, you're incredible Artemis winner and like so deserved. I mean, the oh, Sheep Foundation did thanks. a fantastic <laughs> job with, with selecting you for that prestigious award this year. Oh, and um, it's still really surreal. I mean, I like, congratulations. Like that's um, especially you have such a bright future for hunting and conservation and everything you do. Um, you're really, um, you're, you're paving the way for a brighter future for tomorrow, but you're leaving such a tremendous legacy. You know, it, it's, it's, especially at your young age, it's really, truly incredible with what you're doing. So thank you for that oh, on behalf of like, all of us. My heart, I'm like, oh goodness, uh, I can't take it. No, it's wonderful. <laughs> like seriously, cause I'm not as, I, I'm not, I'm not doing the things you're doing. I don't want, I couldn't imagine doing the things that you're doing, but we all have our place, right? Yeah. So, and thank you for what you're doing and being that woman that's getting up in the courts and writing these letters and, and literally in the trenches for so thank you so much and thank you for making time this week it's such a busy week oh, I know such a busy week I'm just glad we could figure it out I know you yeah. kept sending me times and I was like oh that doesn't work I'd send you a time like that was the worst yeah, I'm I know like, oh, it's I'm a so crazy week we, so like, this works good yes, we, perfect. we got it ironed out and yeah so thank you for making the time taking the time oh. we are actually gonna go to a cocktail reception now. Yes, like, absolutely. It's drink Let's go 30. celebrate yeah. some SCI and so some hunting. This day is a wrap. <laughs> you guys, thank you all for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We appreciate you coming and joining us here in Nashville at the SCI's 51st anniversary convention. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments, look no further than Hornady Outfitter ammunition. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.